radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses, Uh, yeah, it's Monday, Monday, May 7th, 2018, 127 days into the new year, just 238 days left, we are live from a bunker. Somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. All across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? I hope you had a great weekend. It was challenging around here. So much, so much to do. And uh, but but we got it done. And I'm talking about on Stellar and and the show and show prep and websites and social media and everything else. It was just a very very busy weekend down here in the bunker. And over at the house. Rita had me uh, doing my chores all weekend. Saturday night, by the way. So, you know, I'm I'm doing chores. I'm vacuuming. I'm mopping. I'm cleaning. I'm doing laundry. I'm doing chores, right? Chores. Kitchen chores. And I turned to Rita. It was like 8.30 at night. And I said, hey, can I please now, I did my chores, can I please go get an on-stellar? She goes, okay, 15 minutes. I was like, what? Well, okay, it sounds like a fair trade to me. You know, got my chores done. I get 15 minutes online. <laughs> so I jumped out on Stellar. Hey, everybody, I got 15 minutes. What's up? You know, and uh, Rita said, I, I just want to go watch movies now. Let's go relax. Enough of that internet stuff. And she's right. So that's what we did uh, on on Saturday. It was just so much fun. And uh, there you go. Uh, exciting uh, weekend around here, though. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio, at J Church Radio. Uh, temporarily, uh, for the time being, you can still uh, uh, follow and like over at uh, Facebook uh, until that thing runs its course. And, of course, YouTube, you can subscribe over there. Tonight, we have a very special guest. First time, Freddie Silva is here. Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times is the discussion. One of uh, the great researchers, one of the great speakers uh, out there, Freddie Silva, joins us tonight. So this is going to be one of those shows. I can, uh, I'll can. i go ahead and put the, the F2B guarantee right on the front. This is going to be one of those shows uh, that you'll remember and listen to over and over again in the archives. So, But tonight you get it live. And Freddie will be at... Contact in the Desert uh, coming up later this month in three weeks. Uh, We'll be out there. I can't even believe it. Three weeks uh, out of Contact in the Desert. And I was uh, talking to everybody, the Fader Knots on the Bunker Cam, uh, right before the show, that after tonight, after the discussion with Freddie tonight, (laughs) I'm laughing. Yeah, that was me this weekend. That was me this. (laughs) That's going to get a retweet. That's uh, me with a vacuum cleaner. Yep, that was me. I, I admit it. I admit it. Uh, so funny. It, you know You know how I tried to get out of my chores this weekend? 
I turned to Rita and I said, uh, can, can I go buy a new vacuum cleaner? Don't need one. But I was just trying to delay things and I could go up to the store for a couple hours and go shop and then come back and put the new vacuum cleaner together and then somehow just run out of time. You know, that was the plan. She saw through that, man, like a clean piece of glass. So I was saying to everybody uh, before the show uh, on the bunker cam that after tonight, I can guarantee that everybody listening to this show and listens uh, to Freddie will be at Freddie's presentations at Contact in the Desert. You will chase him down and uh, go in and hear what he has to say. He he is that electric. It's going to be a great conversation tonight. Tomorrow night, we have Nick Pope and uh, technology, alien ET tech, disclosure, alien religions. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow night. Of course, we got to talk about the MOD uh, with uh, Nick. I'm sure uh, all of the current subjects in ufology in our community will be uh, talked about tomorrow night. And then Wednesday night, we have a very special surprise guest. We can't announce that yet, and uh, but that will be Wednesday night. Thursday is another Fader night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live, followed by open lines all night long. Now, for all of you uh, new listeners to the show, we are completely interactive here. Uh, we have our chat rooms over at KGRA and Spreaker. They are uh, live in front of me. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let's just do this. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. There you go. Um, and Twitter is always up live in front of me. We use TweetDeck. If you want to hang out with us, get TweetDeck. That's the easiest thing to do. But certainly the sandbox is accessible with hashtag F. To B F the number two B hashtag F two B on Twitter, and uh, there will be a few thousand tweets tonight uh, posted right there live during the show. Come and join in on the conversations and hang out with all the other fader knots. It's a great place to hang out. Hashtag F two B Q is fade to black questions. Any questions or comments during the show tonight, and uh, I will get them. And, okay, uh, this just popped up uh, 15 seconds ago. Hey, JC, I'm looking at OnStellar right now. I want to make a donation. Do you know if that part of the system is fully functioning? I want to make sure that my money gets to where it is meant to go. Thanks. Yes, I believe that it is, actually. Um, I had a couple of uh, people today uh, told me that they made donations. Uh, so, yes, you can go and do that. And, as you can see, for every dollar, it's not actually, well, it's kind of a donation. You're actually uh, purchasing tokens. So uh, you get five tokens for every dollar that you donate. So if you want to test this system, this is from Eddie in Pennsylvania. Eddie, if you uh, want to test this system, donate five bucks. See what happens in your wallet. And and you know what? Just for me, I should have done that today. It got away from me a little bit. I was actually going to donate myself just to test the system. But I understand that it's working. We wouldn't have it up there if it wasn't. So uh, go. Go donate five or ten bucks. And so, yeah, that would be a good way to get 50 tokens. Um, I'm going to get to all of that in just a second here. Um, but you can email throughout the show, uh, which is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. But I've got some breaking news, and tonight after the show, Armenia will be electing their new prime minister, Nikol uh, Pashinyan, and he is the leader of their Velvet Revolution, a revolution that the mainstream media chose to ignore. Ten days ago, he was arrested in the streets, yanked by his neck. And then he was released, and then one week ago, today, the ruling Republican Party rejected him, and he was the only candidate. I don't know how that's possible, but Rita and I watched it live. The revolution continued. The population in Armenia literally danced in the streets, blocking the airport, government buildings, the streets, shut the city down with music and happiness. And the government caved. And tonight, to tomorrow already in Armenia, a new beginning. And I'll just say this, never give up, never surrender. Okay? Seriously. 
Now, the shirt that I am wearing, and I'll stand up. Uh, uh, go ahead, Frankie Four Fingers. Here's your shot. The shirt that I am wearing right here. Look at that. How cool is this? Okay. That shirt has a slogan on it. It's right there in Armenian. Dukov, meaning with courage. Whatever you do, do it with courage. Okay? And, uh, by the way, Dukov. Dukovny. Ah. Think about that for a second. Right? Okay. So there you go. And Rita's going to uh, post up in Twitter. If you guys want to get one of these shirts, they got the really cool hats, too, as well. Um, it'll be up here on Twitter in just a minute. And uh, you'll be able to go in and get your own. But uh, they're very cool shirts. Hard to get here. Um, uh, here in Burbank, Glendale, which is, uh, uh, a huge, uh, uh, uh how, how do I say it? a huge community of, uh, the Armenian people. Uh, so here, this is the shirt to get. Don't ask me how I got mine. It wasn't easy. I didn't do it. Uh, my daughter pulled some strings <laughs> and got us the, uh, the t-shirts, uh, the singer for system of a down, uh, he's over in Armenia, and he's uh, participating in all of this, too, as well. And so uh, it's just exciting times, and that's going down tonight after the show. So you know what we're going to do? Uh, we're going to stay up all night, and we're going to watch all of this uh, live streaming out of Armenia. It's great, great, amazing television. And we've been doing this for the last two weeks. And, and I've just got to say, to watch... Uh, to watch the Armenian people take control of their company uh, country after all of this this corruption and, and repression is it's just the most amazing thing to see old young children students uh, the military everybody in the streets the ruling elite there uh, you know you're a politician making decisions, but yet you own the only sugar company in Armenia. <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute. You know, and it, it's been like that. That is the example of the ruling elite, the Republican Party, is all these rich people that own everything, and they make decisions with the law to benefit themselves. And so you have really rich people and really poor and no middle class and no reason to have hope. Well, the Armenian people stood up, and they are done with it. So that's what's going down tonight. Okay, Rita, get those links up. I want to uh, uh, I want to get those up in Twitter uh, for the shirts and the artist. Um, there you go. Okay, today is day thirteen of Von Steller of the Alpha testing, and now uh, a huge update happened over the weekend. A uh, big, big, big deal. Uh, not only on the look and the feel and the user interface, but a b bunch of functions are now uh, live on the site. Um, it's faster. It's cooler. It's better. It's amazing. There are thousands and thousands of people over right now on OnSteller. You need to go and get registered and, and get your profile going and go check it out. We're going to be... Uh, Alpha is, is running so amazing right now that... We're probably going to bounce out of alpha and, and get straight to beta. Uh, there are a couple of major uh, features that are going to be added in the next day or two. But one of the things that it has been launched in this, and you got to go do it, you got to go register to see this, is now your wallet is there. So if you're a registered user, you've got a wallet, a crypto wallet with tokens in it. And it's right there on your profile page. Only you can see it. Nobody else can see how many tokens you have. But you go and you write, and right there, boom, wallet tokens in it. It's free tokens. And it's 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 a way to uh, get you started at OnSteller so you can go and have fun and 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 support and and upvote and downvote and all of that. Um right now the the wallets are there. The tokens are there. Can't use them yet because the blockchain is going to be added uh, in in a week or two, and then once the blockchain gets added, maybe it may be a little longer. It's security stuff and things that we're working on. But once that go, we're hitting the ground running. Okay, so go now and and register over at OnStellar. Uh, the security it's decentralized, a token economy. 
Um, it's Internet 3.0. It's it's fast. It's sleek. It is an amazing social media platform. And I can assure you, if you haven't been there yet, go and register now. It's simple. Just on Stellar.com. Okay? We, uh, that should redirect you to alpha at onstellar.com. We sent out emails today to everybody. And uh, that has registered and pre-registered. So now you've got it. You click on the just right there. It goes straight. Everything is streamlined and running. And so there you go. All right. And um, uh, John, uh, uh, Frankie Four Fingers just said, I don't see my wallet. Well, it's because Susie's got her hands on it. Okay. I'm just going to let you know now, John. You got to be careful with that. All right. Think about it. No, your wallet's right there. You go to your profile on the left-hand side of the page, right above your friends and groups. It's right there. There's your wallet. It's uh, sitting right there. So go and uh, register today over at OnStellar, O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-R.com. You can also go straight to alpha.onstellar.com. Okay. Uh, here you go. Thank you for posting that, Rita. Everybody, here's the T-shirts and and stuff. Uh, if you want to go and check that out for uh, the Armenian Revolution, just absolutely incredible what's going on. I can't wait to get this show un- underway tonight because Freddie Silva's here. We're going to have an amazing conversation. The time's going to blow by. It's going to be super cool. And then in the car, back over to the house, Armenian Revolution. <laughs> In real time. Oh, we're watching all these YouTube feeds, and we've got tablets and cell phones going, and, and we can watch everything. It's, it's just it's just uh, so cool. So there you go. I see my wallet. Yes. Yes, I see my wallet. Yes. John gets his wallet when uh, Susie has a sunroom, just saying. <laughs> oh, you guys are too funny. Um, okay, good. Uh, there we are. Um, now, a couple of things really quick. <clears throat> Soul Tech Gathering. I got a lot of email over the weekend, and I realized that everybody's starting to gear up for the summer and starting to make plans. Um, so soultechgathering.com is where you need to go. If you go over to Jimmy Church Radio, you can see the Soul Tech Gathering uh, uh, banner right there. Click on that. You'll see all of the speakers. We're going to be updating um, over the week the actual uh, content and curriculum that we'll be teaching up there at Soul Tech at ESETI Ranch. And uh, all of your information uh, is there. And you can also go over to ESETIEvents.com and uh, purchase anything that you need. And that includes, you know, your meals. Because, remember, it's ESETI Ranch. You're going to be there. So if you're going to be camping... You can have meals and you're going to be cooking at your campsite. Great. Okay. If uh, you want to uh, get some meal tickets uh, because the food there is absolutely incredible, um, you can do that too. Campsites and all of the information that you need is is right there. We're only selling 300 tickets. Somebody asked me the other day how many tickets are left. And I can tell you this, not many uh, and it's my guess as of today, probably less than a hundred. And we're only selling three, and it's going to sell out. So I keep warning everybody, go and get your Soul Tech tickets now. We cannot sell more than 300. Not 301, not 310, not 320. The capacity is just that. It's 300. That's it. And that, and, I mean, that's it. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Okay. All right, SoulTechGathering.com. In three short weeks, we will be uh, out at Contact in the Desert, which is June 1st through the 4th, 2018, and Indian Wells, Palm Springs, at the Renaissance Resort and Spa. Uh, We're going to be broadcasting live like we do every year, fade to black in front of a studio audience, and that'll be on Friday night. There are four straight days and nights of events there And you can just click on the banners at jimmychurchradio.com. It is the biggest and best UFO conference in the entire world. And uh, the greatest lineup of speakers uh, tonight, Freddie Silva, uh, will be speaking there. And tomorrow night, Nick Pope 
uh, will be speaking at uh, Contact in the Desert. So go and click on the banners, get your tickets. Um, on Stellar is going to be there. They're going to have a great booth. We're going to have a booth. Stillness in the Storm and Modern Masters, all four of us, are together with one giant footprint. So come by and say hi. And uh, a lot of uh, the industry leaders that we have, the influencers over at On Stellar, will be hanging out also over at the On Stellar booth and the Fade to Black booth. And uh, there you go. So come by and say hi. I uh, just got a text from Sukalos right there. <laughs> and he says, oh, he is funny. He is literally in, uh, uh, he is in, right now, he is in Sardinia on his way to the South Pacific. Uh, he's filming uh, the new season of uh, Ancient Aliens. <laughs> I'm just like, dude. I'm so jealous. He's like, don't be jealous, man. It's just work. But uh, there you go. So anyway, Sukalos is going to be on the show. Okay, that's uh, what we are talking about, and we'll get him on uh, next week or the week after. Okay, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. It, over 850 archive shows, uh, custom apps, Apple, Android, uh, all for just $2 a month. You can also become a fader not over in our membership section on the site. I got some emails from everybody over the weekend saying that they got the new Fade to Black shirts. Thank you, and uh, that they look great. And then I also got a couple of emails saying, uh, if I renew, do I get the new shirts? Yes. And then I got other email, and everybody listening right now, you know who you are. I got email going, you know what? I want the old shirts. So <laughs> it's like a weird thing. So, you know, the new shirts are for renewals. The first time uh, subscriptions uh, to become a fade or not will be the old shirts. That way you can get both. You want both. You want the original. You want the OG shirts. But um, uh, you get uh, the new shirts with a renewal. All right, let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Nobody. Nobody influenced me. (laughs) That's what it's reserved for. Nobody did. Not today. So there you go. On this day in history, though, it was a big day. 1965. In the early morning hours of May 7th, 1965, in a Clearwater, Florida motel room, Keith Richards wakes up from a stupor, grabbed a tape recorder, and laid down one of the greatest guitar riffs of all time. That's right. The opening of I Can't Get No Satisfaction happened on this day. (laughs) Then he promptly fell back to sleep. And that is a fact. I'm not making it up. That's, that's, That's how it went down. Yeah. Makes you wonder about the night before. Right? Think about that. But it happened, OTD, on this day in 1965. Fader fact, again, I love it when I get to this part of the show. I I really do. River Moon Coffee. Fader fact. Now, you're sitting around with your rock and roll buddies, and you guys are trading your trivia. And, and, you know, somebody whips out, you know, who made uh, Randy Rhodes' first guitar, and you say Carl Sandoval, right? That's not that good a trivia. You know, and... Uh, who really played bass on uh, Quiet Riot's first album, right? Okay, it, it, it wasn't Rudy Sarzo, right? So, okay, so I get that, right? And that's that's basic trivia. This is what you whip out on your rock and roll buddies. The piano that Freddie Mercury plays on Bohemian Rhapsody is the exact same piano that Paul McCartney plays in Hey Jude. Whip that out. Your musical pillar of knowledge. Think about that. Um, over the weekend, that's a fader fact. That's, that's real. And if you kind of close your eyes and you're kind of thinking about that a little bit, they sound the same, don't they? Well, they should because they are. Over the weekend, I highly recommend uh, HBO right now has got a series now, there's part one and part two out on uh, Elvis Presley, about Elvis Presley. It's called The Searcher. 
And uh, the the artists and friends, uh, I mean, Bruce Springsteen and, and Tom Petty and others, uh, are narrating and commenting throughout uh, the series. But the footage that they've acquired for this is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The director, John Landau, uh, did an incredible job on this, on how uh, not only how it's put together, but the storyline. And if you're an Elvis fan, more than likely you think that you've seen everything before. You've seen all the photographs. You've heard all the stories. You've you know, but this one is different. It's uh, very very well done. So I highly recommend it. It's called The Searcher, and it's on HBO. And if you've got HBO. Uh, um, uh, on DirecTV or whatever, you can see it on On Demand, uh, part one and part two right now. And I don't know if there's going to be a part three. I haven't gone that far. But uh, it's it's unbelievably uh, great. Uh, so there you go. And also, um, in The Searcher, now I just talked about Tom Petty and, and Bruce Springsteen. Last night, Rita and I were watching, and I said, is that Tom Petty? Turned out it was Tom Petty. Um, but there is some audio interviews of Elvis when he's like 17, 18 years old. Listen to his voice. He is 17 years old. He's a kid. And it stops you in your tracks. And uh, so I had never heard. I I thought that I had uh, uh, gone uh uh, far, far and wide with Elvis, and it was uh, just very informative, very fun, very cool, and very well done. And so go and check that out. And when you do, listen for those interviews uh, with Elvis when he was a kid in part one. It's, uh, you know, and the thing is, I, I've got to I get out of here and get Freddie on. Um, when you're listening, right, you're listening, you know, you're watching, and you hear these snippets of these interviews come in, and you say to yourself, "Well, is, is that Elvis?" And then it's just like, "Wait a minute! Holy crap! It is Elvis!" Yeah, go and 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 check those out and listen to his uh his intellect at that age. Incredible. Um, so there you go. All right, tonight is a uh, Freddie Silva, and I mentioned earlier Freddie is going to be at Contact in the Desert after tonight's uh, conversation with Freddie. If you haven't heard him before. Um, you should be stopped in your tracks. But um, after listening to Freddie tonight, when you uh, uh, go and see him at contact in the desert or you see him uh, walking around, go up to him and and, and say hello because he's uh, incredible. His research is, is, you'll hear it. So we'll be doing that tomorrow night. Nick Pope is here. Uh, we are going to discuss Disclosure. Alien Tech and Alien Religion, and that will be tomorrow night, Thursday night. Very special surprise guest. And uh, Thursday, or Wednesday night, Thursday night, uh, we will be doing Fader Night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live, followed by Open Lines all night long. That's it. It's Monday. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Follow me on Twitter right now. At J Church Radio. Simple. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'll be right back with our guest, Freddie Silva. Stay with me. Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black. 
you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from Rivermoon Coffee. Yes, Rivermoon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Natural Health Solutions with Chris and Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie. How you doing? Great, Chris. Now, you're the CEO of GetTheTea.com, right? Yes, I am. What is GetTheTea.com? I mean, is this tea you buy in a store? Well, no, it's not. Life Change Tea is just that. Life Changing. Life Change Tea is an herbal tea that gently cleanses your body from intruders. What do you mean by intruders? Well, intruders are toxins, chemicals, GMOs, heavy metals, and more. They're in our food, in our water, in our air we breathe. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. And Life Change Tea will help you with removing these, as you say, intruders? That's right, Chris. Are there side effects with this tea? Well, you might lose a little weight. When you clean your colon, you lose weight, you feel better, and you have more energy. Wow. Ronnie, where can people purchase Life Change Tea? Oh, that's easy. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Ronnie, I want to thank you for being on the show. People, don't forget, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences, autographed books and DVDs, chances to win all inclusive conference cruises, and private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. This segment of Fade to Black is proudly brought to you by Life Change Tea. Just click on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code FADER, F-A-D-E-R. You get yourself some free shipping. And I do want to remind everybody, uh, tomorrow night, uh, our guest is Nick Pope. Wednesday night, we have a very special surprise guest that uh, we will announce uh, Wednesday morning. Thursday is another Fader Night with John Rappaport. Open lines all night long. Tonight, it's Freddie Silva. He is a best-selling author. He's a leading researcher of restricted history, ancient knowledge, sacred sites, and the interaction between temples and consciousness. He is also a leading world expert on crop circles. He has published five books in five languages. He is described by one CEO as perhaps the best metaphysical speaker in the world right now. That's pretty heavy. For two decades, he has been an international keynote speaker with notable appearances at the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine, and the Association for Research and Enlightenment. He is featured on Gaia TV, Ancient Aliens, BBC, and radio shows such as Coast to Coast, and now officially Fade to Black. He's also a documentary filmmaker and leads private tours to sacred sites around the world. His website is invisibletemplate.com, and I would like to welcome, for the first time to Fade to Black, the one and only Freddie Silva. Freddie, good evening. How are you? Hello, Jimmy. I feel so much better having listened to that wonderful heavy metal music. I want to dust out my Fender Strat and go play it right now. Yeah, what do you... 
uh, Freddie. I'm uh, a penny to twelve. Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, what kind of strat do you have? I've got. Uh, let's see. I was always looking for something that's a pre CBS one because I like the big headstock. But somehow. Right. And I finally got some money and I moved to America and I moved to Chicago and uh, got myself a decent job. And I thought, I've got some spare money. I think I'll go and buy myself an 80 standard American Fender Strat with a special pickup in the treble position, which makes it go to about 50 oh. rather than 11. It's so good. Yeah, I don't but know. he hates me because I spend so much time writing. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and I, I've got the same problem because I'm a big Strat guy. You know, I'm a Strat collector. And if you've oh. ever, yeah, if you've ever seen any pictures of me or uh, the bunker here, you can see uh, some of my strats hanging on the walls around me. And uh, but sadly enough, they look good. I don't have the time to play them. I've, I've got hanging behind me right now. You can go poke around online. I've got a Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, 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 right, right, right behind me. And oh, it's no. it's gorgeous, right? It's the I am number not one. Worthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's hanging up behind me. It sounds great. It looks great. But it, unfortunately, I just don't have the time anymore. The busy lives we lead. But I'll never let it go. Right? Oh, just, I know. I know. Once those calluses start to go on your playing fingers, I know. it's very hard to bend those strings. I it know. Sound like uh, an old fifties record that's being played backwards. <laughs> Not fun at all. Fender sent me an amp uh, uh, a few months ago, and uh, it, which I have here in the bunker, and it's a you know it's a gorgeous amp. They send it uh, for me to check out, and of course, I didn't send it back. I stole it, but it's it's here, <laughs> and and I plugged in and you know pulled down a, a guitar or two, and for two or three days. I just, you know, played, and it's just so funny. I'm like, man, uh, uh, I don't have those calluses anymore. You know, I can't do those <laughs> things that I used to do. I need to respect that. And uh, but anyway, uh, we just don't have time anymore. I would love to be able to do it for ten hours a day, and just can't do it. So, oh, Freddie, no. Freddie, this is the deal here. This is your first time on Fade to Black, so I've got it to is. I've got to give you the first time guest disclaimer. Okay, <laughs> which is this? Well, are, you, are you a bunch of beer or something? <laughs> yes, I know, right? Which is this? It's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. Okay? Well, that's how I usually do it anyway. Yeah, there you go. So you ready? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, your your presentations and your documentaries are incredible. And well, thank you. Th no, they are. They truly are. And you present them in a way for those out there that have done a lot of research, they will still get those nuggets that they are looking for. And I find that important. Um, but you also present in a way that is digestible. But this is where I want to start with you. Um, there is, going back throughout history, and it doesn't matter where you go on this globe, uh, there is... A, a hidden truth and a hidden message that is preserved, apparently, allegedly, apparently, for us today, <laughs> right? It, 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 was that done with intention? Did we have to figure it out? And was it preserved for us today? Oh, I think it's been preserved for us for, uh, all time. Uh, because and part of the reason why you and I decided to come here and you know, and spend a, a goodly amount of time on planet Earth and then leave and sort of bugger off and go somewhere else uh, is because we, we come here to do things. We come here to figure things out. And uh, if you remember when you're sort of born, you tend to sort of not remember where you've been before. And this happens, of course, to everybody. It's part of the mystery of uh, reincarnation, which is you forget where you've come from. And then, of course, you spend half of your life you know, buying the right books, going to the right conferences, trying to remember where you came from, to trying to remember what it is that you're doing down here. It's a sort of a paradox of life. And um, the whole point why certain things are sort of kept uh, sort of secret, let's put it that way, is because you have to do the work. Uh, you have to get begin little tidbits, and you have to do the work. You've got to put in the hours and the effort and the pain, of course. It's all very rock and roll. And, uh, and then basically you, you sort of figure it out for yourself. And then once you've 
sort of attain a level of responsibility with the information. I and mean, I'm talking about stuff that, uh, you know, like in the old days, and I'm, talk- I'm going back 5,000 years now, uh, it was not unusual for uh, people sort of, who were curious like us, to go into a mystery uh, school and say, you know, I'm really curious about how they move those big rocks, you know. And I'm meaning really, really big rocks that few cranes can uh, lift today. And, you know, they take you in and they'll, they'll observe you for about a year and then give you sort of basic truths and uh, subtle hints and metaphors and things like that. And once they realize that you're clever enough to work it out and that you're responsible enough to handle the information for the common good, um, then they will give you into the, uh, get you into the biggest secrets. And that usually would take place in the third year of your uh, ministry in these temples. Right. And that's pretty much how it's always been. Um, I mean, I get a lot of questions about, you know, why are the f- things like the t- Knights Templar are so secret and the Freemasons so secret? Are they nefarious? Well, not really, just because, you know, uh, there's a secret and there's a, a dark room next door. It doesn't mean that there's evil going on in there. It's just that some things was, uh, some information is so uh, valuable and so important that uh, it requires a person with good integrity to apply it. Otherwise, anyone could apply the kind of rules that uh, p- uh, the mystery teachings would teach you and then, then go off and do silly things like create earthquakes and destroy pyramids and, you know, and blow up Vimana craft over India, that kind of thing, and start a war between the gods. So it was all about responsibility when you come down to it. So that's the really reason why, you know, uh, we are given things in a, in a, a sort of a drip feed, uh, go as you, uh, as you go stage. Because we're also here on a, a collective journey, and, it, and uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a powers that be, and you can call them aliens, spirit beings, uh, whatever makes you comfortable. And uh, they, they, pro- they basically have a vested interest in us to figure out that uh, we're going to do things properly. Uh, so they kind of sort of change their um, agenda relative to how we change our agenda collectively. So things to have a habit of changing as we develop as well, because whatever we do down here echoes in eternity, uh, whether it's good or bad. So other life forms also have to adapt to our behavior. So again, that requires the information to again be uh, drip fed in a certain way so that then we can keep up with the information and applied accordingly. Um, so it's actually nothing very nefarious at all. It's actually done for our own good, actually. Take me back. Take us back. Everybody has that epiphany, that moment. And for you, what was it uh, when you said, wait a minute, you know, let's pump the brakes. There's something going on here. Was it a specific megalithic site? Was it a book? Uh, what was it? It was a whole bunch of things, actually. Um, I never really was comfortable with the way I was being taught things when I was at school. Something just didn't fit. Uh, I remember reading Eric von Daniken's work early on in my life when I was a wee nipper in London and uh, putting up my hands during religious education class and saying, actually, the parting of the Red Sea was done by a UFO. I read it somewhere. And that got me into a lot of detention for several days. Uh, I knew then, uh, and, and the detention usually hurt. It usually involves sort of uh, the beating on the back of your hand with uh, big, thick pieces of wood. So I figured that something wasn't quite right here. I mean, if God was supposed to be uh, a very loving person, why was this person so judgmental and so nasty? Um, it didn't sit well. So, of course, you know, as I go through my professional life, I start reading books about channeling or about sacred sites or about pyramids. And they begin to work on me bit by bit. But the definitive moment, really, uh, was when I got, uh, and and it's an extraordinary story, it really is even today. Uh, I was literally um, lifted off the ground inside a crop circle and taken out of body for about 40 minutes and uh, had a wonderful experience with some lovely beings, came back, and um, out of that came a best-selling book, which I had never really planned to do in the first place. So I could probably say that that was my definitive moment when I realized that there's something else happening beyond us. There are other people involved in the universe who are looking after us. Uh, They are very concerned about our welfare. And if you ask the right questions and are of a certain kind, and I also believe that you're also born with a certain uh, agenda uh, when you come here. You just don't find that until later in life. Right. And that applies to all of us. Um, I just found at that moment that uh, there was some guidance going on here. I hit something very profound. I'd asked uh, certain uh, questions, and I figured that there was something within the crop circle phenomenon that was of huge benefit to society. I just didn't know what it was at the time. And literally, the moment I came back from this experience, the next day, I started writing like an 
idiot. I couldn't stop writing. And uh, as, if any authors are listening, you'll know that you have to have a structure to your writing. You have to have a plan of chapters, a, a certain mode of thinking that leads you from A to Z. Um, this wasn't happening at all. It would start off in chapter seven, chapter one, chapter eight, chapter 15. It was all over the place. And in the end, it all made sense. And that was what the scary thing really was about. And uh, no matter how many weird uh, pieces of information I was putting into the book uh, that seemed to have come from nowhere, I was then able to back it up with hard science, which took me about a year to actually look for the information. And it was there. You just have to look under some very strange rocks. But uh, I would probably say that was the moment in my life where I realized I've got to give up my day job, um, which was not rock and roll, by the way, um, <laughs> and go and do this and give up everything, uh, you know, my marriage, my house, my cars, I mean, literally everything and the hit rock bottom. But it was really worth it because I feel from the uh, reports that I get back from people still today, 15 years after that first book was published, they still feel it, it changed their lives for the better. So I guess... Um, for me, it's uh, a wonderful compliment that uh, I've sort of made that commitment, uh, pushed the boat out a little bit, had this extraordinary out-of-body experience, and then came back to tell the tale. So it's kind of shaped uh, the way I see things today. Let, let's talk about that moment because uh, it's when, when that does happen. Uh, it, it well, okay. First off, it's life-changing, but also it could be unintentional unexpected or something that you were trying to do um the the out of body experience right this 40 minute journey uh, was it an accident did you expect it no, I didn't. And that's what was fun about it, because sometimes it can be psychosemantic. I mean, you can create these occurrences if you believe in something so badly that you will create it. Exactly. But most of the time, it comes from your own, uh, from your own ego. No, this didn't, I mean, never even in my wild imagination that I believe that this could happen. Uh, I was just asking some very uh, innocent questions. You know, for example, I've got all of these bits of information about crop circles and how they're actually made. Now, I'm not a physicist. I have to learn everything from scratch. So I don't have an agenda to play here. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. And uh, this is back in 97. I mean, I remember this as clearly uh, as I'm speaking to you now. Uh, I remember talking uh, and working with Colin Andrews at the time, who was the acknowledged expert on the subject at the time. And um, I said, you know, I really want to connect the connection between the magnetism, the electricity, the uh, alteration in the gravitational field, the soil disruptions we find in the real crop circles, and how do they all connect together to alter consciousness? I just don't have the answer to that, but I'm sure there'll be a crop circle this season that will help me understand this. And uh, he would come, uh, uh, call me every single day and show me pictures of brand new designs, and I'd go, nope, that's not the one, nope, that's not the one. But I had no idea what I was looking for. That was the funny thing. And uh, people who were around me could swear to this story because they, they almost thought the whole thing was very comical. And uh, right towards the end of the season, right towards the end of July uh, in England, there was, uh, we were called to go to this field and it had two designs in it. And um, I was there with a very uh, interesting psychic who collected, collects messages from the circles and really helped us to understand a lot about them, which we could then validate scientifically afterwards. And she went off ahead into the second circle. I stayed behind in the first one. And it's a, in a field where I've always been attracted to. Uh, whatever landed there, it always got me involved in, for some reason. Uh, I always call it my field. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was in the, in the first design with a friend of mine taking measurements and, you know, making calculations and the usual heads stuff and then we walked quietly to the second one which is only a couple of hundred yards away and the moment i walked in i just knew i i, I remember saying to the uh, to my colleague i said this is what i've been looking for but of course you can't see it because you're on the ground you haven't seen the aerial shot yet so how do i know this is what i'm looking for but i can feel it and i'm going this is the atlantean six petal flower and the, he says what the hell is an atlantean six petal flower and how do you know it's six petals and i said you know, I have no idea what I just said. Just ignore me. I'm just, you know, obviously I'm not making much sense. And it turns out, actually, it was a six-petaled flower. And then all kinds of other geometries were involved in there that you couldn't see with the naked eye. And uh, sure enough, uh, my friend of mine, who was very intuitive, comes back and says, um, this message is for you. And I said, what is it? Um, they're saying, if you wrap yourself in the petals of this flower, the secrets of the circle-making process will be given to you. 
And I went, you've got to be kidding me. Right. And that's when you realize you're just not making this up because she couldn't have he- heard me when I said she was 300 feet away. And I was talking very quietly. Anyway, and I did go back in there in the middle of the night, uh, you know, with great reverence, uh, took a little bit of music with me back in the days when we had, and uh, anyone who's younger than 50 will have to Google this, cassette tapes. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you had, and there was a C90 tape, which means you have 45 minutes on either side, and you had a little boom box. And I kind of just took it with me uh, just to sort of make myself feel at home. You're in the middle of a field. It's very, very dark. Uh, you know, it can be a little bit dis- um, disempowering. So I figured I'm going to take some quiet little uh, meditational music with me, just sit there. And uh, I just remember lying down and the, the rain started coming down. And I thought, you know what? I didn't come all the way here. And I was living in America at the time. Oh, Friday, I didn't let come me... all the way to England for a whole sort of four weeks at this expense to be rained upon. And now that I'm lying here connecting with whatever it is that's making this and getting some information. Uh, help if, me, if well, hold available. on. Let me, jump so, in. Uh, Let me jump in real quick. For the visual, for the audience, are you in the exact center? Oh, no. I'm actually inside one of the petals of the flower. Oh, that's even cooler. Okay, so yeah, uh, I get Because you. the center is not necessarily the energy hotspot of the crop surface. That's right. You have to actually understand where the center is. And it takes either very sensitive equipment or a pair of bent coat hangers called dowsing rods. The two will give you exactly the same result. So once you understand and you walk around enough times, you'll understand where it is. Um, so I'm kind of close to that energy hotspot and, um, you know, middle of the night starts to rain. I think, stop raining, please. I don't want to get wet. And it stops raining. And I'm going, this is getting weirder. And, um, then I kind of lied down. I was getting a little bit, uh, sort of fearful because I could hear these footsteps coming, um, behind me. And I thought, oh God, I forgot to ask the farmer for permission. I really shouldn't be here without his permission. I better start making some excuses and show him some credentials. And then um, this bright light just comes uh, above me to the point where I'm batting my eyelids. uh, And I'm thinking, you know, I don't really do abductions. It's not my thing. They happen, but it's not my thing today. Thank you very much. I've got work to do. And then I felt as though someone came up behind me when I'm lying down on the the wheat. And they hit me with, with a baseball bat on my neck. And it didn't hurt. But suddenly, I felt all sense of trepidation disappear. I could see my left arm floating past me and my right arm floating past me. And I'm going, that's interesting. And then I can't feel the floor behind me. I'm realizing I'm floating above the ground. And next thing, uh, I'm, I've crossed over some barrier, and I see three people on either side of me uh, dressed in the most beautiful satin sort of clothing. You can't see their faces. They have cowls halfway down their um, their faces. And I've come across them before as well in other places in, in the world, which I will come to later. Um, and there's two people at the at my feet making the most wonderful gestures with their hands like uh, dancers from Bali. And I know exactly what they're, what they're uh, saying, but I can't hear it. It's a nonverbal communication. I'm totally blissed. Uh, I feel very loved, very protected. I have no sense of fear whatsoever. And then I hit, hit this click, and I hit the ground with such a thud that two days later, I still had a, a, a bump on the back of my head. And that's when I realized that 45 minutes had gone because the tape had finished on one side. Wow. And it felt like it took no time at all. And I tell you, after that, um, I started writing and writing and writing. And again, I had no idea this was possible. Um, I wasn't even expecting it, and since then there's, there's been this wonderful collaboration with the uh, the makers of the circles, which uh, we uh, we call the Watchers because that's what they call themselves. Tell me, uh, and tell me that. Well, you're going to tell me the truth, but I'm going to say, tell me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to do better than that, Jimmy. I'm right. going to not tell you the truth. I'm going to tell right. you facts. <laughs> At the end of the 45 minutes, right, and you heard the click, did you want to yeah. go back? Did you try to go back? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing this for the rest of my uh, This is back in 97. Uh, every single day I wake up and I think, why did you let me come back? Right. Because it was so wonderful. It's like there's no pain. I want to go there. And, of course, the point is that you, you, your job is just not done. Uh, right. There's a reason why you're here and why you're still alive. You know, And if you're still alive, obviously your job is not over. Um, but I have come across them in many occasions. In fact, I was just talking to Clifford Mahuti, uh, the Zuni elder yeah. uh, at um, – 
the New Life Expo in California. In fact, I'm going to be with him again at Contact in the Desert in three weeks. He's amazing. Uh, and uh, we're talking about the watches. They're saying, oh, God, yes. I mean, they, they were the ones who were responsible for us sort of um, coming back from uh, Mu, the continent that sank 11,000 years ago. And it's because of uh, them that we were able to land in the Grand Canyon. And from there, we uh, became the people who we are today. And uh, we call them lookers. Uh, and that they're the ones that are responsible for the, you know, uh, up to, uh, maintaining the sacred sites, the sacred knowledge. And, um, and I said, well, you do realize that they're also making the crop circles or the original crop circles in England because we call them watchers. And they also appear in Egypt. And I came across them again in, inside a king's chamber uh, in total darkness in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, and there's three people who can actually verify to this. We're in complete darkness, and uh, we're there to clean up the place because people do some strange things in the Great Pyramid. So mm -hmm. we have to basically clean the energy there uh, with a certain ritual, put it back to its intended um, space. And uh, in the middle of this chamber, which anybody who's been there knows how black it is when there's no lighting in there, um, I'm suddenly look at toning the place using the, the, uh, the power of my voice. And uh, I see about 30, 33 people the same, dressed in exactly the same way and very tall, coming out of the, the stones and surrounding us in pitch darkness. And I can see them as clear as I'm, uh, the desk I'm uh, sitting next to right now. And it was the weirdest thing. And uh, we're, we're toning and I'm going inside my head, I hope these three people can see what I can see because I, it would be great if they could validate this. And sure enough, afterwards, um, when we finally sort of left the building and there was four guys who obviously had an experience and, you know, being guys, of course, nobody wanted to say anything. And I said, well, all right, I'll go first. Did anybody see what I <laughs> saw in there? And one of them said, oh, there's these people that came straight out of these stones. They're dressed in this sort of white satin. They're about, you know, eight feet tall. That, so it actually happened. I, I, well, is that what you saw? I said, that's exactly what I saw. Uh, you, again, you can't make this stuff up. So it's, they, they appear in uh, different corners of the world at different sacred sites. And that includes... Uh, the crop circles, because they literally are built on the same premise as a Great Pyramid or as a Stonehenge. They just happen to be pressed into wheat or barley, that's all. So those people that were here throughout history uh, seem to be coming back again to give us a bit more information. We've got about a, a minute before we uh, hit the break, so I'll ask the question quickly and hopefully you can get it out, which is when you have a witness with you that uh, affirms you know, what you have just seen, does that help you, or does it even matter? Oh, absolutely helps, absolutely. Because, I mean, when I first started doing this work, I mean, there, and uh, hand on heart, I was getting a lot of things completely wrong because they were the creation of, you know, my own desire. For example, when I started dowsing, uh, I had to throw away three years of work because I finally met someone who was really good at it and said, actually, the results are coming from your own desire to actually create a, an effect. So this is your training now. So you have to do it the hard way. And after a while, after a lot of experience, you begin to realize to differentiate what's coming from your mind and, it's actually, well, and what is actually happening. But I have friends of mine who, even, uh, who are very psychic and work with the police and the military in England uh, and have a near 100% record in finding missing people. And uh, even they, still after 40 years, still require some kind of verification. So it's, it's a way to sort of keep the, uh, the ego in balance, you know, to, and almost like someone's going to give you a pinch once in a while to make sure that it really is happening. And believe me, it really does, and it can happen to anyone. Let's take a break right here, Freddie, and when we come back, can we talk, uh, let's go megalithic. You ready? Well, okay. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Our guest tonight, <laughs> Freddie Silva. This is Fade to Black, and again, uh, Freddie will be with us out of Contact in the Desert in three weeks. You can go to contactinthedesert.com. Tickets and info are right there. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Freddie right after this short break. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, Fader Knots. 
This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science. Human function based on the endocannabinoid system, or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness, foundation is support for your ECS, and fit capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit NewPharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's G-N-U-Pharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my very man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Ancient Life Oil. Life changing. The real oil. CBD is truly ancient life oil from the source. This oil has no psychoactive effect and is also legal in all 50 states. When you're healthy, you're happy. The truth about this wonderful plant is that it wants to give back to mankind life, longevity, and happiness. Ancient life oil are golden grade, all organic, non GMO, and infused with high quality liquid coconut oil. It's simple. Just go to ancient ancientlifeoil.com today that's ancientlifeoil.com the best purest organic and non-gmo cbd in the world go back lee tappy the statements made regarding these products have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. We'll get Freddie's Twitter up here in just a minute. This segment of Fade to Black is proudly brought to you by River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Best coffee in the world. Just uh, click on the River Moon Coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B blend. 15% off of your order. Our guest tonight. Freddie Silva, one of the great speakers in the world and, and filmmakers and authors. And, Freddie, what, what I find really interesting um, about uh, your research is you look at it from another angle, and, and we need to do that today. I'm uh, constantly bickering about Egyptologists and, 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 and academia. <laughs> but when we look at you just mentioned uh, the King's Chamber. But the King's Chamber, the Queen's Chamber, uh, the Grand Gallery, these are all modern names. Um, I don't know if we have any clue, really, what is going on there. And we need researchers like yourself and and others out there, Graham and Shock and John Anthony West, God rest his soul. Um, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to, to try to uncover what's going on. Um, so when you mention the King's Chamber, uh, what do you think... Uh, what do you think is actually going on there? What do you think its original purpose was? 
Oh, I think it's multidisciplinary, like you said. I mean, uh, I, I've had conversations with the people you just mentioned, uh, by the way, and we basically agree on uh, one thing, that we all have to see it from slightly different points of view and take a very multidisciplinary approach. And, and once you get yourself out of the, out of the way, it's amazing how much work you can actually do. Um, with regard to the uh, Great Pyramid, um, I was kind of following the usual dialogue of the fact that, well, there's no one buried there, and never has been, and there's no evidence that anyone's ever buried there. Um, I, I like Chris Dunn's approach, uh, that he's looked at the whole thing as a big uh, energy device, and it's very plausible. Uh, can we prove it? No, but there's a lot of evidence that he's actually put together to make a very coherent argument. Um, I began to look at it from, the, from a slightly different point of view uh, again. I just finished uh, writing a book called The Lost Art of Resurrection, which really looked into the, uh, into the exact question that you're asking, which is, why is it we have so many anomalous buildings around the world, especially where there's supposed to be tombs, and there's no one buried. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those moments where I sort of took a step back and just got out of my own way, and I was reading the um, the wall of the uh, supposed, supposed tomb of Tutmosis III in the Valley of the Kings, which is very anomalous uh, because of one reason, uh, among others, is, and that it has a well. Now, why would a dead guy need a drink of water? It doesn't add up. Um, the tomb is aligned to the northeast, which is something you just did not do in metaphysics. Um, dead people are usually aligned east-west, which follows the equinox and the rebirth of the soul. So northeast is usually a, a place of um, ancient wisdom, a place where you go to get information and knowledge. And then if you look at the actual inscriptions on the walls, uh, you begin to realize that they're giving you a schematic of what looks like the passages inside the Great Pyramid. And one of those wonderful moments where suddenly everything just clicks, I suddenly realized, well, you know, Herodotus, when he was first writing about the Great Pyramid, he did say that uh, actually it began in a shaft and a mound that uh, once used to be navigatable along the Nile, mm -hmm. which we now know to be correct, because right. there are obviously a lot of uh, hollow chambers underneath the Great Pyramid. The Nile went right up to the very door. And yes, uh, when you go to the very base of the Great Pyramid, there is a shaft which is now filled in by debris. And it's inside this room, which is kind of uh, honed out of the living rock in a very very rough manner. And suddenly you sort of look at this and you compare it to the king's chamber and you think, what a wonderful polished room. And you realize that when you actually do the actual um, movements along these passages, you crawl out of this um, uh, horizontal um, tunnel. Uh, and being six foot five, it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, you're almost like uh, uh, crawling around in humility in this rough uh, home chamber and this rough rock. And as you climb further up into the uh, inside of the Great Pyramid, the tunnels get a little bit wider, a bit more polished. And by the time you actually come into the king's chamber, you actually bend down again in humility, which is what you're supposed to be doing when you approach a, a place of extreme uh, sacredness. Right. And then you're inside this beautifully polished room and you realize, my God, that's a wonderful metaphor of the path of the initiate. You've gone from a rough stone to a polished diamond. And uh, suddenly I'm putting the two things together and I'm thinking, well, I've seen this before in other parts of the world, like Tintagel Island and the story of Arthur, who is essentially a, a remake of the story of Isis and Osiris. And of course, the building and the, great, and the Giza Plateau is the house of Osiris, who happens to be the guardian into the, into the gate, into the other world. And he, of course, represents the a path of the, uh, the highest level of the initiate, which is to have an out-of-body experience for several days inside a sarcophagus and then... And three days later, after having been in the other world, completely coherent. And I'm not talking about a shamanic experience here. I'm talking about a, an induced near-death experience right. where you um, uh, metaphorically meet your divine bride and you marry her because she is the embodiment of all the wisdom that's ever been and ever will be. Uh, so he marries Isis, comes back into his living body as Horus. Uh, that's why he avenges his father's death, except the, the death was always metaphorical. He was never literally killed, just like so many other heroes that, uh, you know, they die on the um, winter solstice, uh, get nailed to a cross and come back three days later and rise from the dead. All of this was a metaphor. It, never, it was never meant to be a real story. And uh, Jesus was included in this story, by the way, which is why the early Gnostic Christians were really annoyed with the fundamentalists, that they completely took, got the wrong end of the story and uh, ended up with something called the Catholic Church. But that's not the story. Yes, it so is. So the Great Pyramid essentially is um, as a method uh, in which you can actually create a certain environment using the uh, position of the building, which is on 
several meeting points of the Earth's telluric currents. Uh, you have the specific use of stone, which creates a wonderful piezoelectric effect. You have a gravitational anomaly. Uh, and all of these things, including the sonic frequencies in the building, uh, get you to have an, uh, an induced near-death experience. It's very dangerous, by the way. And uh, it was uh, only uh, given to the highest level of initiates. And again, usually only after three years of training. They were very serious about this. Um, so once you line the sarcophagus under the right condition, you go away uh, for a, a prescribed a, mirror, a, a moment of time and you come back and you are declared raised from the dead. And uh, this, by the way, happens in many places around the world. So that was my take on the, on the Great Pyramid. And it seems to make a lot of sense because just down the road at Saqqara, there's another pyramid which was used exactly for the same purpose. And that was the Pyramid of Unus, where we find the pyramid texts. Mm -hmm. And they do describe the actual pharaoh leaving the body reaching the other world, and they're saying, you've reached us alive, not dead. Well, of course, that's because his body wasn't found in that pyramid. He was actually buried elsewhere. So that answers that question of why these pyramids, there's no one ever buried there. They were never meant to be burial chambers. There's two significant points with what you just said that I'd like your comments on. Number, the, the first thing is, if we go with traditional dating at, at 2650 B.C. Uh, for the uh, Great Pyramid, to have this kind of sophistication in culture when this is technically still Stone Age man. It, you know, we are talking about a real grasp on something that we don't understand today. And I... I want your comment on that, the advancement of consciousness and the understanding and the curiosity uh, that they had with the other side. They certainly understood something that we don't, we don't clearly uh, uh, understand today. Yeah, I mean, we have religion today, which is not the same thing. It's basically the bastard son of initiation. Uh, you know, and when you lose the fundamental understanding of anything, what you end up with is superstition, which is what essentially most organized religion really is. I right. mean, it's like when I have discussions with people about Catholicism and Christianity, I say, well, I wouldn't confuse the two because Christianity is actually a very interesting thing, which is actually a very, very old idea. And Catholicism has nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. Um, we're really talking about a kind of a uh, level of training that was goes back, as far as I can figure it out, about 8,000 B.C in the Far East, anything that you can pinpoint today to out-of-body experiences, to mysticism, to early Christianity, um, all of this goes back to Japan. And I found this in a, um, a book that was translated recently. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman that did it because he's a genius. Uh, it'll come to me. Uh, and it was basically the Kujiki uh, 72, and it lists uh, something called the 17 Ways. And uh, these ways essentially it became the fundamental principle behind Freemasonry, what it is today. They, they traced it all the way back there. And all of these teachings already survived uh, another culture that basically perished before the Great Flood 11,000 years ago. So we're talking about uh, two cultures that are living side by side on the planet Earth. At least that's my understanding and the, the understanding of several people, um, most of which we, we know their names quite well. Um, and... Um, Basically, we had another culture here that completely understood the facts of life, the laws of nature, how to bend them, how to use them to your will, and then do interesting things with it or not. Because, of course, you know, na uh, energy is just energy. It doesn't give a damn either way what you want to do with it. It's your ego that directs that energy to do good things or bad things. Uh, that's what it comes down to. And um, so we have, this is why there's, there's this conundrum of, you know, Stone Age people and Neanderthals, you know, drugging uh, their knuckles along the ground, and yet you have this at the same time, concurrent with this view, this high level of initiatic uh, practice, uh, right. this high level of building construction, you know, uh, lifting 1,600 ton rocks uh, as though you could levitate them at will, which they, uh, they probably could. So I think that's where we begin to sort of draw a distinction that there were people who, uh, just like today, there are still uh, people in uh, somewhere in Polynesia that probably have never even met white people or any uh, people from the first world where they basically uh, uh, have des uh, developed a space travel. These people are still living in a very primitive way. Well, the same thing would have been happening 11,000 years ago as well, I think, all things being equal. I think that there was another culture here who lived very separately, uh, pro possibly on islands. Uh, it's something I'm researching right now for my latest book. I think they kept themselves to themselves. They were a society apart, but 
if people, if normal humans were curious, they would give them the information and they would allow them into their teachings. So that would, in, in essence, would put them back into the Neanderthal culture uh, and the Stone Age culture, and it would help humanity evolve because some people had already received that wisdom and they could teach others like them. And I think that's the way it's always been done if I follow the trail that I find all around the world with indigenous cultures. There's always someone else around who keeps themselves to, to themselves, but they're always there if you ask them for help, and then they're quite happy to give you the information, and then you have to process the information and apply it and um, sell it to your fellow man. That's the way it's always been done, I think. Well, there's that part of it, uh, which suggests a lot of sophistication, a technically advanced culture, when Absolutely. clearly there was other things going on that wasn't. But at the same time, uh, when you walk into the king's chamber or other uh, sites around Egypt, but you walk into the king's chamber and it's still perfect, right? It hasn't shifted. Cairo, yeah, right. Cairo has been leveled how many times in the last 5,000 <laughs> years from earthquakes? But yet here we have uh, the, the Great Pyramid still uh, nearly as it was when it was originally built, whenever whenever it was originally built. But it hasn't well, I, shifted. I think it goes back to, your, uh, to your other part of your question, which was when was it built? I think all the arguments are actually correct because you have to understand the basic principle upon which temple making is, is created. And that is the temples have to be mirrors, perfect mirrors of the, of the cosmos because the ancients recognized that here on Earth, you know, um, it, we have a, a process called uh, life and decay. And in the middle of that, we have ego. And uh, when you connect those things together, they can get things, things can get really, really bad. And they reckon that if you actually created buildings and temples that are the complete perfection and the mirror image of the perfection of the universe, which goes around in, you know, perpetual motion, always regular, always, something you can always look upon the sky, and it's always there, they reckon that if you take that image and a mirror on the ground, that anyone that encounters these temples or these buildings and interacts with them, then has the opportunity to become like them, to become as perfect as them. And this is the way it's always been. So what happens is, because the Earth uh, has a thing called precession, and every 2100 years, things start getting out of alignment, it means that your temple also has to move in alignment. And this is why you find places like Luxor in Egypt with two different axes, because you know, after 4,200 years, your alignments are completely way off. You have to redesign the temple to become a mirror of what it's looking at. And the same thing applies to the Great Pyramid. Uh, the shafts are after, obviously are aligned to uh, points in the heavens, which refer to what, tw uh, 2650 BC. But I do believe that the foundation of the buildings is at least 10,500 BC, as dictated by the, the rules of um, the mirroring of the stars, which, of course, the three pyramids mirror Orion on the spring equinox of that date. So all of these things are correct. And if you were to uh, uh, say this in Central America, to the Maya, who are still alive today, by the way. They never went away. They're still just hiding in the jungle. And I have a wonderful teacher down there. And he said, you know, it's quite funny that our pyramids, the archaeologists will say, well, they're only about 800 years old. And they said, well, perhaps that was the last time they stopped building the pyramids. But if you go inside the pyramids of, say, Ushmal or Chichen Itza, there are like Russian dolls. There are pyramids within pyramids within pyramids within pyramids because you have to keep building, realigning, and resizing things in order to be a mirror image of what they're supposed to be looking at. And now it starts to make a lot of sense, and the arguments start coming together quite nicely. You see what I'm saying? I do. And then... You know, of course, Baval and Shock, uh, who, uh, you know, I've spoken to many, many times, uh, the uh, the Sphinx being uh, aligned with Taurus at 10,500 B.C. certainly would suggest the construction of, you know, the erosion and everything else comes into play. But when you Absolutely. look at a, a technical alignment of the stars, that just adds to the evidence that something is tremendously old there. Absolutely, and if you, and in fact, the more you go away from Europe and the uh, that old Victorian thinking, which was still uh, in the midst of, by the way, uh, all of the archaeological setbacks and roadblocks that we find as independent researchers really come from Victorian mindsets. That uh, again says that uh, only white Caucasian people in the last 
400 years uh, are civilized. Everybody else is just uh, illiterate and, uh, you know, an idiot that wears uh, animal skins. Well, on my travels, which are extensive, and I'm sure many other researchers who do what I do will agree with this, um, the more I go away from Europe and the more closer I get to the Pacific, the more I learn that those people are actually way ahead of us by thousands of years. And the one thing that they always said is we've always had help from the star people. Uh, we still have that help today. They still come around every few weeks for tea. Um, and they kind of talk to them as if you and I are just sitting at the bar uh, every other week. Right. For them, it's not a big deal. And they, and they always refer to them as the star walkers uh, or the people that, are, that uh, fly to the stars and back. And they have complete understanding of the cosmos and the laws of nature. They know how to bend everything to their will. Um, so it seems to me that these people are way, way ahead of our thinking. And uh, that basically presumes then that this, the temples that they built also were mirrors of the places where the, not only they came from, but mirrors of things that, that humans are supposed to learn from. So, for example, in, going back to Egypt as an example, um, we have a lot of temples with sphinxes uh, aligned outside them, like rows of sphinxes, miniature ones. And that would have been done during the age of the Ram, which would, of course, have been Aries. And that puts a date on that as being between about 3000 and uh, 1000 BC before it goes to Pisces. So everything has a mirror of everything else. So if you start looking at temples which are uh, uh, which have um, features which are synonymous, let's say, with sound, and there's quite a lot of them, and they are very, very, very old. Of course, that was the time when the pole star was in uh, uh, Lyra, uh, in Vega. So that dates that to about eight to 9,000 BC. We're now That's talking right. about go back to Tepi and beyond. Right. So you see how it works. Everything is a mirror, and all of these things had to be uh, mirrors of the, of the heavens so they could be reproduced on Earth, and that helps us date things a little bit better. I'm um, just going to do this once. Uh, I think you'll appreciate this. I, I I mentioned Gobekli Tepe so much on this show. I in my commercials, anything that I do, yeah, coast to stuff. coast. Yes, <laughs> coast to coast. When I sign off, I sign off with Gobekli Tepe and and so forth, uh, because it is probably the most important site uh, yet discovered on this planet, and it is it's it's that magnificent. But also, this audience plays a drinking game. So every time Gobekli Tepe is mentioned on this show, they have to drink. So in the spirit of that, and with your great accent, say Gobekli Tepe one more time. Gobekli Tepe. That's what I'm talking about. Right there. And okay. I'm having a nice drink right now as well, actually. We call it research in the business. Um, and, and so, but we, now we have that, right? Gobekli Tepe wasn't supposed to exist. Everything, Whoops. right? It, it, it was all about the beginning of Egypt. Maybe you could get Mesopotamia and, and ancient Sumer into the conversation, but... It was always, you know, ancient Egypt. And certainly now that's not the case. And we can back up 7,000 years before the Great Pyramids and, and, and Egypt. And, and we have Gobekli Tepe lining up with some extraordinary, uh, 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 you know, astronomical connections here. So Absolutely. Yeah, what and do you, in fact, it's getting weirder and weirder because there was carbon-14 dating of some of the post holes at Stonehenge. Uh, which dated to 8,000 BC. That's right. Uh, that's just real back 5,000 years. I got that from a psychic in England 20 years ago. Uh, they've just done the work on it. So, uh, I mean, people uh, that I'm uh, friends with, they're so ahead of the the game. It's unbelievable. But And it's also very reassuring for them, too. Um, we also have Tiwanaku, which is uh, dated to 15,000 BC, which we always forget about because there's so little of it left. It's been so um, broken down and used for railway uh, ballast, would you believe? And what hasn't been broken down into uh, useful uh, material has been stolen by uh, people for collecting. But uh, it's still a most incredible site if you ever have the courage to go up 12,500 feet to the uh, Bolivian Altiplano. It's one of the most extraordinary places on Earth. And, uh, and the site next to it, Pumapunku, which is even more bizarre, uh, of course, there's a technological stonework, uh, which even today, stonemasons looking at this say, how on earth did they put, pull this together right. 17,000 years ago? And of course, 
Yeah, and the more you travel, the more weather it gets. I mean, I just found the picture in Saqqara in Egypt, which has exactly the same lintel with the same compound curves with the same stone that you find in Pumapunku and also at Oyentambo in Peru. Now, what are those things doing on opposite sides of the world? Uh, it begins to sh- show that uh, these temples have been built and rebuilt and rebuilt again and again and again. So uh, this is how uh, academia looks at this stuff. I was uh, well, about, shots. Uh, yeah, check this out about 10 years ago. Uh, this is 2018, 2008, 2009. I'm with Michio Kaku. And I literally said, I brought up Pumo Punku and Tiamanaku. And I said, you know, there's a possibility that these sites uh, are 15,000 years old. Impossible. I said, no, 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 because no, 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 it's impossible. <laughs> and I said, but the stone, you, first off, Jimmy, you can't date stone. And and number two, there's the Ice Age. And, and number three, man uh, wasn't intelligent enough. Uh, really, no, the answer is no. He wouldn't even talk to me about it. And I said, let's, you know, now he wanted to talk about, uh, uh, you know, type zero, type one civilizations and ET and intelligence in the universe. He was cool with that. But as yeah. far as even just contemplating or considering uh, anything before 10,000 years ago, off the table. He, he I mean, did I not feel go. for them because they have to. Uh, it's a very conservative uh, preoccupation, and also um, they, there's only so much money to go around. In fact, not much money to go around at all, and uh, there's a few tenures at the university, so they have to put, uh, toe the line to a certain degree as to what is acceptable. But you catch any of these people off uh, the record, and they will say the evidence that the independent researchers are coming up with, it completely undermines everything. We have What we're teaching is, is complete fraud. But I can't say that on record, obviously, because I have to publish. And once I stray from that line, I will never be able to publish again. So I kind of feel sorry for them that they're stuck in this situation. But at the same time, isn't the point of science to to follow the lead of the evidence? I mean, that's how I was always uh, taught. You know, this is the evidence. Uh, We then surmise based on the evidence that this is the conclusion. And that is the theory that we have until another piece of evidence comes up. And then we have to reevaluate the theory. That, for me, is good uh, good research and good science, isn't it? Yeah, you have to question and you have to learn. You, you know, right. you, that's the only way to move forward. Um, and when we talk about Gobekli Tepe, uh, there is huge possibilities of Gobekli Tepe not being the only Gobekli Tepe. There could be Gobekli Tepes all around the world, and I'm talking about 10,000, 12,000, 15,000-year-old megalithic sites of extreme technical uh, advancement uh, that weren't Cro-Magnon and weren't Neanderthal built, <laughs> right? And, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's the one in Indonesia, at, uh, and I forget the name of it. Gudam um, Pateng. That's the one. That's the one. Uh, and uh, they thought that that was an artificial mountain until, oh dear, they probed and they found some carbon-14 dating. Uh, and the uh, and Danny, the local um, archaeologist, he's gone to a lot of trouble with the local archaeologists about that because, of course, he's upended their model. You can't do that. You're not supposed to have um, you know advanced civilizations in Indonesia uh, that are 21,000 years old. But, That's right. But there's the evidence again. He's actually followed the protocols. He's got the carbon-14 dating of of, um, you know, uh, material that he found at 120 feet inside the actual hill, and that's the date that uh, they're getting back. So you have to follow that evidence. So I think uh, the Earth is beginning to give up a lot of its secrets, and I am almost tempted to say suspiciously at a time when NASA is preoccupied with asteroids. And that's the one thing I found in my research is that, and it's, it's incomplete at this point because obviously the data is, is incomplete, but I'm looking at patterns and I'm observing how every once in a while we across the face of the earth put down our tools, put down our food, and we go on a big, a, 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 excuse me, temple building binge across the world. We just go and build temples like crazy. And within 50 to 100 years, we are hit with big asteroids, which resets the clock. Uh, so just before Stonehenge, or when the stones, the blue stones are added, we get hit with the meteorite. Uh, 2600 BC, same problem there. 1300 BC, and so on and so forth. And I just find it rather curious that uh, we stopped building temples uh, for the last two and a half thousand years. The only thing we've really done 
uh, was the Gothic cathedrals that the uh, Templars and the Cistercians introduced into Europe in the 1200s. And then there's nothing until the crop circles show up. And they are built exactly on the same principles as the old temples. And it's rather interesting, I find, and kind of alarming, although I'm not an alarmist person by trade, that suddenly they seem to be filling in this blank, almost as a warning, suggesting perhaps you should take a look at what the skies are doing, because so many sacred sites around the world are obsessed with monitoring the heavens. Uh, I was just in Orkney, which is north of Scotland, and uh, some of the stone circles up there are beyond words. I, I, I fail to describe what's up there. And again, why not just put up a bunch of sticks in your front lawn and look at what the stars are doing? Right. You don't need a, a 200-ton rocks to tell you this, unless, of course, you're trying to preserve this for posterity, for the next generation to learn, and so on and so forth. It's about keeping track of what's going on in the heavens. And I just wonder, uh, because there is one crop circle that was very prophetic uh, back in 1994, Five, I want to say, um, that actually shows a perfect mirror image of the inner solar system, including the asteroid belt, except the Earth is missing. And uh, my good friend, the late uh, Gerald Hawkins, who you know, decoded much of Stonehenge in his uh, famous book, he was also the one person that came up with five new mathematical theorems in the crop circles, a genius and a gentleman. And uh, he said, you know, it's interesting that uh, the configuration of the planets as shown in this crop circle gives you an actual date of about 2034, which is about the time when NASA suddenly realizes, oh, there's a big object coming this way called Apophis, which has a very good chance of hitting the Earth. So there is a bit of a warning, I think, here to sort of, you know, keep track of what's going around you because, you know, people will survive, as they always do. Uh, we will sort of have to sort of reset things. But at the same time, people will have to maintain the knowledge. It's important to keep this for the next generation. And the Egyptians found themselves in exactly the same situation 11,000 years ago after the flood. And if you read the record on the walls of Edfu, it tells you that after the flood, there were these seven shining ones, also called the followers of Horus, who basically were in charge of rebuilding, and I quote, the former mansions of the gods, uh, which would form the foundations of the future historical temples. In other words, what we see today, well, so I've got to jump in. To that. I've got to jump I'm in sorry? and take a commercial break right here. So we'll pick up right when we come back. And I got to tell you, Ed Fu, it, that's the one. That's the game changer. It's <laughs> a good me. one, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Let's talk about all of that. We'll pick it up uh, when we come back. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva, the Faded Black. I'm yours, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio.com. <laughs> Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. 
Do you worry a lot whether you're a college student, busy professional, parent, or grandparent? Ongoing stress and elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol can rob your memory, your health, and your future. Now you can combat the effects of stress and anxiety while improving your memory and recall at the same time with the dietary supplement Calm and Clever. Studies show that the ingredients in Calm and Clever reduce cortisol by as much as 30% in one to two weeks. Call 1-800-758-8746 or calmandclever.com. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. And fortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Rhys Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. The segment of Fade to Black is proudly brought to you by New Pharma. G-N-U Pharma. Click on the banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B. F, the number 2B, 33% off of your order today. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. And right before the break, we brought up Ed Fu, man. Now, this <laughs> this is what's great about Ed Fu. When Egyptologists or other Orthodox historians and anthropologists, they, they'll, well, you know, Egypt doesn't have a, a flood story. They don't. They don't talk about uh, um, uh, the uh, destruction of uh, the the big A word, which is Atlantis. They they don't bring in. Uh, you know what? Yes, they do. And they do, yeah. They do. Bing, wrong. Thank you for playing. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. You know, and when they bring up Zep Tepe, uh, they bring up uh, the age of the gods before uh, uh, the dynastic period, and it is all clearly laid out there, going back a very long time. But it's very clear and concise, isn't it? Oh, 36,000 years in a stroke. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, in fact, it was uh, thanks to a wonderful uh, woman. I wish I remember these names. Something happens to your brain after 55 or 50. You remember, the, you, you remember really weird stuff, but people's names, you tend to forget them. I, I, um, she was um, an academic in England. Uh, she worked for Manchester University, and she actually transcribed the um, Ed Food text, the building text, as they're called. Very dry, uh, as you'd expect from an academic, uh, but very wonderful because it actually helped me to understand what the hell was going on on these uh, and it's like th- uh, three walls of beautiful uh, neolithic wallpaper and uh, they really set out the process for uh, how to build a temple how to move energy lines how to pin them to the ground how to remove negative energy stuff that uh, you know people talk about in metaphysics all the time and uh, scientists kind of roll their eyes backwards um, of course, now we have the technology to actually measure this energy, so they're not rolling their eyes backwards so much now. Um, but also, they talk about the time before with Zep Tepe and the, and the swallowing, uh, the encroaching of the oceans and the swallowing of the mansions of the gods and the uh, charge by these groups of uh, intelligent people, the Aku Shemsu Hor. Uh, the name, by the way, appears in Easter Island of all places, which is a little bit spooky when you consider that Easter Island is a 19-mile speck of land on the opposite side of the world. Now, how did that get there? That's right. Um, 
Exactly. And uh, they had the same uh, names for the, uh, their platforms and their temples, the Ahu, uh, which they have in Egypt too. And um, they also described the, uh, the people in Egypt also described the shining ones and the watchers uh, having sort of come across from a land to the west, uh, which no one can really figure out where it was because obviously the, the map after the flood was completely redrawn. I mean, for example, the Sahara was an ocean uh, back then and suddenly it's a, a huge expanse of sand. So we can't even begin to realize, uh, I don't think, what the earth even looked like conceivably 11,000 years ago because so many things sank and so many things rose in their stead. But no, I think that they're, they're very um, understanding and very straightforward in their description of the events that um, these people who were very intelligent uh, were set to go out across the world in groups of seven and that uh, they were to, uh, to promulgate the knowledge of the gods uh, to help rebuild civilization and that uh, they were to start um, the civilization in these hotspots uh, called the navels of the earth. Uh, Gobekli Tepe, of course, being exactly the na- uh, meaning of that uh, word. It means the potbelly hill or the navel hill. And uh, you have similar places in other parts of the world like Kathmandu, um, I think the Vatican is also one of them. Or, uh, let me rephrase that. The Vatican sits on one of those such navels. I mean, you can't compare the two. Um, so wherever you find the concept of the navel of the earth uh, around the world, you also find some of the oldest temples uh, on the face of it. Um, again, Tiwanaku is also called the navel of the earth. Cusco. Excuse me, Cusco in Peru is also a navel of the earth. So, and at all of these sites, just like at F- Edfu, you find the same story around the world. Seven people, uh, usually are quite tall, um, which uh, compared to the local culture could be anything uh, uh, seven feet and above usually with elongated heads, with red uh, or, uh, hair or uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. Uh, I just found that story also in the uh, traditions of the uh, traditional people of New Zealand called the Waitaha, uh, which I'm writing about right now, uh, which most people don't, aren't even aware of. I mean, we think about the Maori as being the indigenous culture, but no, there was someone there way before that. And they actually described being on the ocean during the actual flood itself. Uh, and the only reason why they survived is because they were in the middle of the ocean and nowhere near land. And they also described uh, these people as being red-haired or um, yellow-haired, and they said they could move stones at will. Uh, they had power over nature. And again, complete understanding of the laws of the universe and the stars, of course. So all of this is neatly encapsulated in that wonderful place called Edfu. And uh, it's always nice to see that there are also chambers at, uh, under Edfu that they also used for the resurrection ceremonies, just like in the Great Pyramid. Uh, the walls are actually hollow. There's all kinds of interesting things going on in there. So I agree. Uh, I think it's a wonderful site to sort of whet your appetite if you really want to understand the prehistory of Egypt and other things. Why do uh, or why does academia put up the good fight here and they won't relent when there is so much evidence, certainly with Mesopotamia and Egypt being right in our faces, and go back to Tepe now too as well, but where suddenly overnight civilizations had roads, streets, schools, libraries, language, mathematics, engineering, science, uh, understanding the stars, seemingly from uh, a, a Stone Age, you know, uh, in the dirt, uh, forging for seeds to feed your family, to the next day, sculpture, artwork, engineering, mining, quarrying, all of this advanced knowledge, it certainly was taught, but they don't want to uh, go there. Why, why do they continue the good fight? Oh, it's like I said earlier, it's conservative thinking. And also because um, the independent researchers are not part of the club, I think that has a lot to do with it. Because I've noticed uh, as I watch the news feeds that uh, there's this wonderful trend where they suddenly find a way to validate what we've been saying. And once one of their kind does it, then it's okay. Uh, and they start patting each other on the back. Oh, we clever, we found all this out. Well, no, right. <laughs> uh, there's people like Graham Hancock and uh, Robert Schock and so forth. And uh, the people we mentioned earlier, they also uh, came up with this uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, and they've been laughed at ever since. But w- once the, that information gets out to the public, they pay attention. You know, they do pay attention quietly in the, behind the background. But once one of their kind finds a way to stitch the story together in a way that's acceptable to them, then they, they can own it. Uh, that's 
what I find is a little bit troubling about this. And I mean, I, I'm not possessive about my work. I mean, it's, I mean, I draw from other people's work too, and thank God for that. Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't have enough time of the day to do any work because right. I try to string things together. Not one person can know everything, and that's what's beautiful about being an independent researcher. You can ask other people, you know, have you got an answer to this because I'm missing this? And they'll say, actually, I've been working on that. And I was wondering where, uh, what I was going to do with that. Well, I can take that to another level and give it to somebody else. So, you know, we have our own little club, and uh, we're not highly funded either. But it's kind of funny that there is a sort of a mirror uh, of uh, research going on in academia uh, side by side with us. And once they find a way to sort of uh, intellectualize it and own it, then they'll come out and announce it uh, by themselves. It's, it's kind of funny in a way. Uh, last year, <clears throat> I contact in the desert. Just imagine this for a second. I was hosting uh, the this megalithic panel on on Saturday evening. I've got Graham. I've got Robert Baval. I've got Shock. I had uh, Linda Moulton Howe. Um, and as we are uh, just, I, I asked this question. I said, here, you know, we, we've been fighting and fighting and fighting a- academia about the age of the Sphinx or the age of, uh, uh, or the possibility of a highly technical culture from before. But Gobekli Tepe comes along, and you would think that that would be enough to open the door to this argument that has been, you know, ongoing for so long. And it didn't do it. It didn't push things over the edge. And I'm still shocked about that. I mean, what's it's it going to take? It? Yeah, yeah. What's it going to take? Yeah, because they'll, yeah, because they'll have to admit basically that uh, civilization has been a uh, much older uh, concept that uh, has been given credit for. Uh, it wasn't a Caucasian experiment that suddenly uh, grew in the Renaissance and we became, uh, you know, the computer addicts that we are in the 21st century. Uh, it's been going on in different eras. I mean, civilization takes on different forms in different regions uh, with different uh, mannerisms. I mean, what today we consider to be a, a, a computer, you know, a MacBook Pro is like our god now. Or Actually, no. Um, from what I uh, watch with people in the airplane lounges, it seems to be that their smartphones seem to be the new god. Mm-hmm. Well, back 11,000 years ago, I, uh, I'm very confident that uh, the god was actually the manipulation of gravity to move big stones. And, Had to uh, be. I wrote about that in my second book, right. uh, The Divine Blueprint. And uh, lo and behold, I found an experiment that was done at uh, Princeton where they actually looked at the type of rock that uh, they were using for building megaliths. And this, there's a specific type of quartz in it, a lot of it. And they took a little lump of it and they started throwing sound frequency at it. And would you believe that after a few experiments, they actually get the lump of quartz to rise and stand by itself uh, and uh, defy gravity. So now we know that the stories were true, that these uh, uh, monuments, regardless of size, no matter where they are in the world, whether they're up in the, the Altiplano of Bolivia or whether in Egypt or Sumeria, they were moved uh, effortlessly by figuring out the um, antinode to the actual stone, um, lifting them off the ground uh, using anti-gravity and then moving them to the energy lines which are ever-present all over the face of the earth. And a young child could have just used a finger and moved these things along because the stories all say that, yes, they were built overnight uh, to the sound of the vocal commands or the sound of trumpets or musical instruments. So there's always the use of sound. So that was their technology back then. But today, if we had that technology, we would basically cover the entire earth in about an hour with hotels. I mean, we cannot have possession of that technology. We've got to use something else to keep us occupied. Otherwise, we we would have destroyed ourselves through constructing every single square inch that exists. So that's why that technology had to die uh, and had to be buried. It just becomes a part of myth and legend, but it very much existed, and it was the uh, end all and be all back then. So if we could try to look at the past through our own eyes today, we would be disappointed. Uh, we have to look at the past on our own terms and through their eyes, and then we begin to understand. Uh, to me, you know, we have Giza. Uh, yes, we have... Uh, uh, Cusco and and Mexico City and Machu Picchu. We've got these great sites around the world that uh, we all talk about and discuss and research. But right there, the UK and, and France, uh, the UK and Scotland and Ireland, literally covered, covered 
with megalithic sites and and then oh, you, we're giving them away we, i know <laughs> I, you know, I, I watched a documentary uh, a couple of weeks ago on megalithic sites in uh in 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 the uk and i'm not making this up I, uh, it was extraordinary this guy goes out on a private farm uh grasslands right and it's like uh, a thousand acres and there's like three or four stone circles that that and so he's in one of them and he says, I'm probably the first person to ever stand here, that that these are everywhere, and this is a site that isn't even marked, and, and he's standing in a stone, stone circle on his property, and this, you know, and the, the, the people that own the farmhouse, and he points over in the distance, this is in their backyard. And I, I had to, I had to stop and really contemplate <laughs> the significance of what he was saying. Um, it's so humdrum. It really is so humdrum over there. <laughs> it, 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 it's mind blowing, and then you combine the the crop circles and that phenomenon. There's something magical about the United Kingdom that may be si- singular here on on, on oh, I our think planet. It is. Yeah, it's to do with the geology uh, and uh, actually uh, Karnak. In um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm sort of recovering from a bit of a flu. That's why I sound a little bit weird. Um, and Karnak in France is also part of that. In fact, it's even older than most of the sites in Britain. And right. In fact, if you keep looking at the dolmen, for example, you know, which is the classic sort of mushroom-shaped rock on top of three other rocks, perfectly balanced and uh, very economic. It actually goes all the way back to Korea. I mean, Korea has the greatest concentration of dolmens anywhere in the world, and that's a shock to most people. The technology has moved east, uh, moved est- westwards. It didn't actually originate in that part of the world. Uh, even so, if you go to the coastline of like uh, Ireland or uh, Karnak uh, or the Scottish Islands, you'll find some of the oldest sacred sites in the world dating back to at least 6,000 BC in that region. Um, and it is. It's almost like that part of the world was designated as a kind of a library. Now, uh, when I'm starting to look back again and sort of taking myself out of the picture and wondering, you know, if there was a big civilization that lived in the middle of the Atlantic some time ago, 11,000 years ago, and uh, when you talk to people in the Yucatan, they'll say, oh, that's called uh, Atitlan or Atl, as we call it. And they had these magician priests called the Its from where we get Chichen Itza from, and they knew about how to construct temples. And I'm thinking, my God, uh, that means that the other people must have gone to the other side of Europe. And the thing that the story that connects them all is that they were all had a nickname, the people of the serpent. And I found those people in Portugal, uh, where I was born, and that uh, they were very tall. Uh, they escaped the sinking continent 11,000 years ago to the, uh, to the west. Uh, they were said to be uh, traveling gods. They built these extraordinarily tall uh, menhirs across uh, the Iberian Peninsula. They also went to Karnak and built some of the most formidable standing stones you'll ever see. I mean, I've taken people to one called Dole, which is not far from Mont Saint-Michel. And it's impressive when you put 20 people holding hands, and that just about covers the girth of the stone. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, wow, that's a big rock. And I'm saying, no, that's not a big rock. The bigger rock, which is twice the size, is actually in uh, the coast of Brittany. And uh, one of them's actually partly fallen down, one's still standing up. And that is big. And there's another one on an island, which is now an island, before it was connected to the mainland. And that's all part of the Cornwall-Wales uh, connection, which is now basically underwater and not very deep either. So it's uh, when you start looking at the sites on the coasts of uh, Britain and uh, Brittany, you recognize that the biggest and all the sites are all along the coast, and they get smaller and newer as they go inland. So obviously, the natural uh, conclusion here is that there was a seafaring culture that arrived on these shores from somewhere else, uh, deposited this knowledge, and then as the, uh, the years go by, uh, and as the needs become different, the sites get smaller and more manageable as they go further inland. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting observation that uh, you know the uh, co- the west coast of that part of the world is the remnants of a surviving uh, culture. Well, part of of Karnak descends right into the ocean. Absolutely, and I wish that James Cameron would take his submersible and go down there. It's only 26 feet deep. It's not that deep. Right. The, uh, most of it disappeared only 5,000 years ago when there was a 25-foot sea level rise uh, after another um, meteorite attack and a part of a glacial melt as well. And uh, that um, continental shelf uh, where that used to connect with Britain suddenly gets flooded. So if you go on the beach along uh, Brittany at low tide, suddenly these miraculous stones come 
come out of the water. It's it's really quite a sight to see. But you can obviously see from the trajectory of the mapping of the, the sites that there's a lot more going underwater. So uh, if uh, if he's listening, James, uh, do take the submersible down there. It's going to be a no-brainer. There's an entire civilization under there on the continental shelf. Yeah, sign me up. I would, I would, I would definitely. Um, the only problem is that it's very dark because of the sediment that gets kicked up by the Atlantic. That's the only impediment. But anyone with a good camera and a good uh, submersible will make uh, you know lightweight of that, and we should make huge discoveries uh, in no time at all. Last week there was a, a big press release. You brought up uh, Stonehenge and and the dating of of some of the holes now. You know, going back now possibly to eight thousand BC. Uh, last week there was a press release. I'm sure that you uh, caught wind of it. I do want to talk about Scotland. We'll probably do that after the break. But in this press release stating that uh, the horseshoe stone and the the two big stones in the middle of uh, Stonehenge uh, probably were not quarried, that they were already there and that they built Stonehenge around that location and that though the dating of that uh, could now actually go back and match up to this carbon dating, which is 8,000 BC. This is an extra- Isn't that interesting. Yeah, that's an extraordinary <laughs> discovery if that pans out. Well, the, uh, the altar stone, which you actually can't see much of now because it's under a very big lintel stone that's fallen down and also partly covered with grass, uh, that's made of green stone, and that came from uh, the beach of Tintagel. Uh, and all of, of course, its um, grail connection that exists there as well. Mm-hmm. In fact, Tintagel Island is essentially a mirror image of the Great Pyramid. It's the same idea. Uh, the whole thing is hollow. You start off in a cave. You go through the um, um, the island. You access the uh, the top of the island. You go into a chamber, much like the King's Chamber. Just it just looks a bit different. You have your outer body experience, and then you plonk your foot on the on Arthur's footprint. And uh, on the 21st of December, an energy line comes right through that. Uh, for that foot. So, yeah, a Stonehenge is getting more and more interesting, but it's interesting that um, if you actually start in the um, preparatory area, which is down by the River Avon, um, which is the end of the Cursus that bends all the way around to the river, um, those post holes also are dated about 8,000 BC, as are the two post holes, which used to be in the old car park, which has now been grassed over, uh, where they actually found um, the remains of a dwarf buried there. And uh, it was uh, not unusual in the old days for a people who were, uh, you know, they're either very tall or very short to be recognized as very special, you know. Uh, unlike uh, today, they seem to get marginalized. But back then, they were actually considered to be very, very special and have one foot connected to the other world. So whenever there were major changes in climate, these people, especially the dwarves, would volunteer to be killed ritually, and they would be buried at the entrance to the site uh, so that when the shaman and the people were passing over the body of this person, they could more readily connect with the person that's already on the other side and thereby receive valuable information. So that's how they thought. So if that's uh, c- correct, and it is in many, many cultures, then the two post holes in the old car park of Stonehenge was the original entrance to the site, uh, which again, the uh, debris that's been carbon dating there is 8,000 BC. So that puts the entire circle now uh, closer to that date. And again, because of Stonehenge is such a huge calendar in itself, it has to be recalibrated. So the um, blue stones were moved um, from the 3100 BC position to the 2600 BC position, and then the sarsens were added at that time as well because they had to reflect the, the change in the motions of the stars over thousands of years and also the changes in climate that were also happening at those particular moments in time of uh, 3000 BC and 2500 BC. We had significant climate changes where uh, I think in one time there was like a 10-year nuclear winter. I mean, nothing grew. There was uh, like a big dust storm across the face of the Earth. So the uh, the organic nature of Stonehenge is what's throwing the dating off. Uh, all the dates, just like with the Great Pyramid, are probably correct. Well, you just mentioned we've got uh, two minutes before the break. I don't want the, I don't want this to get away from us. You mentioned that there's a Grail connection to Stonehenge. Uh, what 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 did you mean by that? Well, the fact that um, the concept of the Grail. Is, uh, I mean, the, the, the altar stone from Stonehenge comes from a place that's uh, synonymous with the Grail Quest. And, and there are many uh, uh, places that are synonymous with that Grail Quest. It's not just in Tanjore. Sure. Uh, but it, it kind of links it uh, in some way. 
And uh, what was, um, I think it was, uh, there's a friend of mine who's a, a very good mathematician by the name of Robin Heath, a superb guy, wrote a great book called Sun, Moon and Stonehenge. He was helping to piece together the mathematical puzzle uh, of Stonehenge and um, the uh, quarry and also this place called Lundy Island in the middle of the Bristol Channel, tiny little place where it actually looks like an elbow. And actually, there is a Templar site and a megalithic site on that island, which actually forms the trigonometry that actually helps position Stonehenge. Uh, that's an incredible piece of, of original research. And he says that you can actually, from there, figure out the mathematical code to link it to places like Tintagel and, of course, the round table of sites, which it represents, because the round table really is a series of uh, 12 sites around Cornwall and Devon, which actually are arranged around the Sacred Hill in the middle of Cornwall, which are all linked together by the same story. So, and again, the, the Grail really is about the discovery of knowledge, about the discovery of information. Uh, it's nothing really to do with the cup of the blood of Christ. It's, that's something very, very different. So yes, the, uh, all these sites are all connected uh, mathematically. Now, uh, you know what? I'm going to save this question for after the break. No, I'm going to answer the question now. You can answer it after the break. <laughs> just, just like uh, the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge still has all of those same questions attached to it. We don't know how it was built. We don't know who built it. And we don't know what it was used for. Right, we have a, a, again. A, or a, do we? A, or do we? So think <laughs> about that, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk about that right after the break. Our, and, I, and then I do want to discuss your recent trip to Scotland. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. Oh, Freddie, what's your uh, Twitter handle? I don't have Twitter. I I'm a, a Luddite. I only have a website. There you go. I tried to find it, so there <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. More with Freddie right after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. So you went to dinner last night and you had your favorite pasta. Ugh. Or maybe you had a heavy spicy meal and it left you. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional. Ugh. It's all organic and non-GMO. Get rid of. Ugh. We have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one. Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hey, can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... 
You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. The holidays are coming. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more in order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Freddie Silva. The segment of Fade to Black is proudly brought to you by Numana, emergency food storage for you and your family. Just head over to the Numana banner. Use the promo code Jimmy. And uh, every order over $100, you get a, an autographed T-shirt, a Fade to Black autographed T-shirt. And the good news is after tonight's show, I'm going to have Freddie autographing uh, all of those T-shirts because Freddie, you earned it. Hey, I'm going to let you know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reading Twitter here where they're saying <laughs> if you end at 9:30 with Freddie and don't do overtime, there's going to be a revolution. We may have a rebellion on our hands, Freddie. <laughs> oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah, it kind. is. It is. Yeah, it's a threat. Actually, I, I, I'm still sort of um, freaking out over that solo at the beginning of the uh, the break. I I completely forgot what you were saying. Yeah, you know what's <laughs> such a great solo. <laughs> What, you know, I uh, and you want to know who's a very that is. evil show. I mean, you yeah, yeah. you can't concentrate with all this music going on. Yeah, it, it's a Stratocaster too. That's the amazing exactly. thing. Exactly, you See, can tell the difference. Yeah, you can. You can. I'll tell you how we recorded that, and this is going to freak you out. That that was recorded in a bedroom, and uh, and that is a Fender Twin and and some Marshall mixed in, but that's a Fender Twin in a frigging closet. With an SM57. Yeah. yeah. I can believe that. Yeah. I can believe that. You got to love it. You got to love it. So um, uh, back to uh, the thing is, and, and the similarities, uh, I think, are, are are glaring and tremendous when we talk about the uh, the amnesia that humanity gets, right? We, we, we clearly uh, don't know. What do you think uh, the purpose of, of Stonehenge? And, and, and quite honestly, who built it? Well, Stonehenge is a bit clearer uh, because one of the things or one of the laws uh, that's involved in temple making is to do with uh, direction. What direction is a temple facing? And the pretty obvious answer to Stonehenge is there's a great big uh, avenue that stretches for a couple of miles and then bends over to the river. And it's facing exactly to the northeast uh, and where, of course, the uh, summer solstice sunrise used to be uh, until, of course, the earth moved a little bit, a few degrees every 72 uh, years and now it's slightly out of alignment. And um, if you follow that uh, principle, that uh, the direction of the temple usually gives away the purpose of which it was built. Uh, northeast is always a place of learning uh, because you're looking at the highest position of the light during the year and that equates with an inner light and that inner light really comes from knowledge, ancient knowledge. So it's a place where they used to gather, uh, the big minds used to gather uh, on the highest uh, moments when the light had complete um, dominion over the face of the earth, so there's your metaphor. And uh, they, uh, all the savants of the period and different periods used to basically congregate and and uh, discuss all kinds of very intellectual stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, first and foremost, it's, a, it's the most perfect calendar in the world. I mean, uh, Robin Heath, again, uh, the mathematician, who actually wrote a really good book called Sun, Moon, and Stonehenge, which I 
thoroughly recommend it's beautifully put together uh maybe available in america i'm pretty sure it is um he basically has put out the thesis uh, of how they built it in terms of aligning it to the sun and the moon and how it is a calendar that's using the original post holes uh in fact they're not even sure at the moment if there were post holes they uh, seem to think now that perhaps the holes were filled with uh, blue stones that then got moved to the center of the circle uh five thousand years later but those 56 holes that we don't see much of anymore, except for little bits of concrete, um, they are literally are used to calibrate the uh, lunar and solar cycles every eight years, and it's never going to uh, go out of, of, of sync. Uh, so the whole thing was really designed first and foremost as a calendar. Secondly, uh, if you follow the work of my mentor, the late John Michel, genius of a man, he also figured out that if you take the measurements of the lentils and the stones and the diameters of the stones and the circles, you can pretty much, just like the Great Pyramid, extract every um, numerical value known to, the, to describe the Earth and how it works. So just like the pyramid is a one five hundred thousandth um, mirror image of the circumpolar polar radius, and I'm saying this very late at night, um, so Stonehenge 2 will give away the actual uh, dimensions of the Earth, and also it gives away its own degree of latitude uh, because of its um, position on the landscape, which, you know, if you go there today, you think, you know, why would you build this magnificent monument on such an unremarkable plane? And it really is. Uh, then you have to really re uh, realize that when you do the mathematics of the latitude of where it is, it makes a lot of sense because um, if you look carefully around the stones, there are these four little mounds which form a, a very neat little rectangle, and that rectangle actually gives away the actual axial tilt of the Earth, which takes place every 21,600 years. So, which of course now brings up the question: How do they know this? Right. Because uh, first of all, you have to be observant that the fact that the Earth tilts you know, four degrees every 21,600 years, then you have to go, aha, that's interesting, let's commemorate that. So now you have to mark it on the ground at a certain degree of latitude, which probably will take another 21,600 years to complete, and then you have to build the damn thing. So once you add all this stuff, like John Anthony West once said, you know, these things could be as much as 50,000 years old. They've already gone through two cycles of the system because you have to understand the system and the cycle before you can actually commemorate it in stone. And I think he makes a very uh, lucid argument, as he always has done. Um, so it seems to me that the, uh, Stonehenge is a big academy for information, and that the Druids certainly uh, think so, because they still uh, go there every year to do their rituals. And uh, the Druids themselves were very famous for memorizing huge amounts of data to the point where even Julius Caesar was freaked out by them. And uh, the high point of being a Druid priest was to commemorate 20 years of data that had been accumulated for thousands of years and to recite it uh, on the third day of the uh, summer solstice to a rousing round of applause after talking nonstop for 24 hours. Uh, that's quite something, isn't it? I wish we'd do that today instead of sit around playing on Twitter all day long, which, of course, I don't do. Uh, but what about <laughs> and and all of that? Uh, it seems to fit and 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 quite magically. But have you ever considered um, uh, the possibility of it being maybe a tomb, or somebody maybe have been buried there and? Uh, uh, everything else came into play after that, the celebration of of some ancient historical figure. Yes, I have. I mean, you've got to look at all the angles, obviously. Uh, right, otherwise, right. you'd just be behaving no better than academia right. and uh, living in a cocoon. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up, though. Uh, the uh, burials seem to be intrusive. They're too young. And also, if you follow other cultures around the world, no one was ever buried anywhere near the sacred site. I mean, the sacred site was utter perfection. I mean, there was no travesty that was ever took place in there. Uh, only people who were highly uh, um, cleansed of any impure thought, um, and certainly they had to go through a certain initiation process for them before they even were allowed to go in there. They weren't even allowed to take in their negative emotions in there because they were so paranoid that even a bad thought would you know, uh, create imperfection in the temple and it would bring down the entire tribe. So even people who uh, had a bad day weren't allowed in there. That's how serious these people were. And this is still performed in Polynesia in certain secret societies. The burials, uh, once you start looking at the world culture of, of uh, sacred space, they came much later. 
Um, around about 1300 BC, we start getting these mounds built with people actually buried in them. Because right. in Britain, 85% uh, of all the, uh, the tumuli, tumuli that have been excavated, there's no one buried in them. So why do we call them tombs? Obviously, they're marking something else. And uh, anyone that knows about subtle energy knows that the, the mounds are marking the crossing points of the Earth's telluric currents. Now, uh, after a few thousand years of catastrophes and the information starts getting degraded, by about 1300 BC, a lot of people have lost the plot. They don't really understand uh, what these things were really built for, uh, to the point even in Egypt, where the people who were carving the hieroglyphs didn't actually know what the hieroglyphs meant. They were just doing this parrot fashion. Uh, and Wallace Budge actually made a very good comment about that in one of his early books. Um, so... At this point, we start getting these mounds built, uh, getting, uh, built closer and closer and closer to Stonehenge because it became a status symbol for the leader to be associated with such a potent site. And following from that, when we start getting churches, um, in the Celtic Christian tradition, we start getting the encroachment of the body in the actual graveyard because by then, um, they would completely lost the plot of what these places were for. And by the Christian and the Catholic era, people with lots of money, with lots of letters after their name, the more money they have and the more letters are, they have after their name, the closer they get buried to the actual altar, which when you think about it, is the seat of power of a sacred site. That's why it's called an altar, because it alters you, and that's usually where the hot spot of energy is. So the burial uh, uh, scenario for me is something that came much, much later. And, it's, uh, and again, it, like, it's just like in Peru, uh, where we have the Chulpas, those wonderful towers, enigmatic towers on, on Lake Titicaca. They, too, have um, intrusive burials. The actual place itself appears to be thousands of years older, which if you ask the local Ayamara, they'll say, oh, yeah. These things were built by the gods uh, a long time, um, just after a big flood. Uh, the Inca tried to uh, build uh, towers like this, and they're nothing like the originals. In fact, they fall apart, right. and then they began to bury people inside them. So again, they began to lose the plot over thousands of years of use and misuse, and also of um, the sites lying fallow through catastrophic uh, change. So they began to be reused as other, other, uh, for other reasons. I knew this conversation was going to be like this. We talked. Uh, uh, we talked. Three... <laughs> and I keep trying to stay with the music. I know, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And it's funny because three weeks ago, before you uh, set off to Scotland, uh, and you were telling me about your trip, I said, "Look, let's save everything for when you're on the show." Well, Jimmy, no, I don't want to know what you're going to do. I and I don't, you know. And and after you got back, I didn't want to know what you found out. I wanted to save it for the show. And here we are. We were nearly at the end here. We didn't even get to Scotland. What were you? Uh, yeah, what were you I doing did. over there? I was up in Orkney to basically figure out um, a question that's still hanging on me. And again, the, uh, I don't really know where I go with the research. I let the information kind of lead me in certain directions. I'm looking into a very, very old culture. Um, that was around before the flood. I want to know who these people were, who these advanced people were. I'm looking at it from different points of view. And one of the ones I'm really fascinated with are a group of people called the Tuat Banu. And uh, they were claimed to have been older than the Egyptians, which really got my attention because I thought the Egyptians were pretty old. And that uh, they were a very high civilization, tall people with uh, blonde um, hair and blue eyes or red hair and green eyes who lived around the Black Sea in what today would be Transylvania, and the whole area around uh, Romania. Uh, and yes, there is a relationship to Dracula, but it's a metaphor. It's not quite what you think it is, but I won't go there for now. So the two other new were said to be a part of a, a very high civilization that were descended from gods. And in one, uh, one of the myths, they talked about them being actual gods themselves who remain here on Earth to oversee the rebuilding of civilization after the Great Flood. And it was they who started off this concept of the holy bloodline, who then goes to Sumeria and creates the Sumerian culture. Mm. Now, that was a big surprise to me. Mm. The other part of the people went into Central Europe, created the holy bloodline there, uh, which ended up with the Merovingians in the historical era. But the other bunch mysteriously went northwards. They went into Scandinavia, to Norway, and eventually up into Orkney. And uh, I was up in, in Orkney and also the Isle of Lewis, uh, where they have some of my most favorite stone circles in the world. 
And these people looked like they were borrowing from the same manual. I mean, they, they, uh, over the course of at least a thousand years, they were using the same techniques, the same angles, the same chisel points, uh, the same mathematical progressions of alignment to the horizon wherever they went. So obviously they were serious about mapping something out. And eventually they became the royal blood of Ireland and Scotland, which is where they, uh, these people get their red head and their blonde head from, you see. Uh, we always thought it was the Scandinavians, but the Scandinavians got their genetics from these people called the Tuat the New. So I was really, uh, really up there trying to figure out and piece together these um, events and see what were they up to. And uh, one of the things that I found uh, up there was that there were not just two major stone circles, which are the ones that get all the attention, and that is the uh, Ring of Brogar and Stennis. There's a third one on top of the hill, uh, which is a beautiful little isthmus that is formed now by the rising sea level into two inland lakes. And when you're at the top of this uh, now non-existent stone circle and you look down, you get to see a, a perfect plan view and you think, wait a minute, one of these circles is slightly off alignment. And suddenly you get this image in your head of, my God, I'm actually standing on the same ground plan as the Great Pyramids of Giza. I'm looking at an actual ground plan of the belt of Orion. And I've so far, and uh, I'm going to say this tentatively because I'm still doing some research on this, um, I have tentatively located the belt of Orion the first time it makes um, a, a rise above the local landscape in Orkney at that latitude is in 5600 BC. And that uh, basically sets the blueprint for that particular civilization up there. Uh, so it's quite exciting that, um, you know, I don't think anybody else has come up with this. Uh, if they have, get in touch with me because we can share notes and it makes working a lot easier. Uh, but uh, certainly there is a vestige of a, a very ancient civilization up in the Orkneys. They were doing extraordinary things with stones. There's uh, one particular rock, uh, which is on the island of Hoy, which takes a little bit of getting to, and um, very remote. And um, in the middle of this valley, there's this big lump of uh, sandstone, very hard sandstone, the size of a large living room. And someone has skillfully etched out with what looks like a laser, and I'm not um, overdoing this, by the way, uh, they seem to have cut this perfect rectangle out of the side of this uh, stone slab in the middle of nowhere, and then gone around the back of the slab and pulled the whole thing out like a cube. So if you can, and the cube is still there, by the way, and it looks like it fits perfectly into this doorway. Now, how can someone actually go into a big, thick piece of rock, cut a hole all the way around, and then go around the behind it and pull the stone out to create a plug? Now, that I really, mm. really need to know how it was done. Mm. And in this, inside is a very small chamber, which is cut into the three um, shapes, a rectangle, a semicircle, and a, and, uh, a square. And uh, if you lie in there, which I did, and you tone in a very low voice, um, it's like being in the king's chamber. I mean, you have an a, almost immediate out-of-body experience. I, it's the only way I can really describe it. I mean, I was just uh, out of it uh, for a whole hour that I was there. And then I actually went around the back of the stone and found that uh, a traveler from the 19th century had done the same thing. And they'd written in Arabic on the side, I have meditated inside this chamber for two days and I have found happiness. And I think I completely understand what this person was doing. So whoever built this, and by the way, this stone plug, this entrance, is absolutely aligned to grid west. And I mean without a degree of deviation, as though whoever did that was also the Great Pyramid doing exactly the same thing. So again, more mysteries, more, more, uh, more secrets. Well, and the, the plug, uh, how, how big is it? The plug is about, let's say the doorway is about three feet by two feet, uh, because I had a bit of a hard time trying try to squeeze in there. And the plug uh, that fits into the doorway is literally outside the entrance, just right. lying there on its own. And it has a little knob uh, on it, like a little protuberance on it, which looks identical to those little mysterious knobs on the stones in Cusco and Saksawa in Peru, and right. also at the base right. of right. the uh, small pyramid in Giza. And we still don't know what those were for. Uh, they may have been tuning forks. Uh, we don't know what they were for. Uh, the best explanation that I found was that they were used to mitigate the effects of lightning hitting the rock, uh, which may be a good, a good idea. But when this happens just on one plug, on one rock, um, I don't know. I find that one really hard to believe. So it must be used 
to something else. So whoever was doing this was doing it all around the world and uh, literally reading the same manual. Well, you know, um, you know when you build a little model kit, right? The uh, uh, the plastic, right? And you take off the piece, and you have a little piece left over from the injection molding, and you got to cut it off. Oh yeah, it, yeah, yeah. That that's what. Uh, whenever I look at Cusco or the Great Pyramid, and, and I see those little nubs at the bottom, I'm I, I don't know why, <laughs> but maybe they I, that were might molded. be a good idea. Yeah, it maybe they were molded. Angle. Yeah, maybe they were molded. It I, I don't know why, but that's what it yeah. reminds me of. Um, but then again, why don't all of them have them? And I know. Why do some of them have one and some have two? <sighs> it's it's haphazard. I, I mean, there's obviously a code to it, and they're su- uh, they're, eventually it'll, it'll pop up. Pop up. I no, I know. They're there for a reason. I mean, it's oh, it's deliberate. I, I just can't figure it out. But maybe there were you know eighty foot tall giants building a model kit. And, uh, and, you know, well, I, you know, I, I, I mean, f- let's think about it this way. Let's look at Baalbek, for example. I mean, uh, they thought that the that large stone of the quarry was big, and it is, and they figured, well, there's only one crane on earth that can lift that. Well, they've now found two more under it, which is even bigger, which is, these people were taking the mick. They really were. Mm-hmm. And it makes you think, well, first of all, the stories that, when, uh, that Princeton basically validated that there was some kind of acoustic levitation that was used with these rocks because of what they did in the laboratory. Um, if these people were much taller, and by all extents and purposes, they actually were much taller than us, so these large stones to them would have been no more than large bricks um, are to us. So it's all relative. It is uh, relative. Like when you, you know, when you go to some of the places in Sacsayhuaman, if you look at the actual entrance to Sacsayhuaman and the doorways, if you look at the original lintel stone that you have to step over, not the one that you have to step over now as a tourist, but the original stone that you have to get into the temple, that's built for a person that's at least nine feet tall. It's not a practical lintel stone. So, again, you look at this and you think, well, if people were bigger, then using bigger stones would have meant a lot. You know, that would have made a lot of sense to me. Well, when you think about uh, today's modern cranes and their maximum weight, you know, loosely, but let's say 10 tons, that they can raise 100 meters into the air and about 50 meters out, 10 tons max. Okay, th- that that's mind blowing. But then when we start <laughs> thinking about a two thousand, a twenty five hundred ton stone like Baalbek, now we're, we're get, yeah we're getting into a I mean, zone. There, there is one crane in the shipyard in Tokyo. I, I think it's Tokyo or Shanghai, somewhere in the Far East, uh, that actually can lift a, a sixteen hundred ton ship all in in one go. Uh, and that's how they figured, well, they must have had a crane that could have done that. Yeah, but now you've got a problem because you've got two bigger stones under this, which are <laughs> even bigger than that, and now we have nothing that can lift it. So why work with something that's so huge? I mean, were they trying to prove that, A, they could because it was fun and easy, right, uh, probably, right, right. or two, because they wanted these things to last because they, they had the foresight to recognize that humanity was going to go down a dark road yet again, as we tend to do from time to time. And we had to be reminded of these things from the past to show us, yes, there was, that civilization is a recurring thing. It's a cyclical thing. And some will, will, will see it and some won't, and that's fine. But the fact is that you know, this, this thing is cyclical, and we keep repeating the same processes of civilization and decay. So you know, don't get too hung up about it. Just accept it for what it is. But you know, learn from your mistakes. That's a big, le- big lesson that we're trying to learn here. Well, you know, when you look at Cusco and you hear the question over and over again, you know, how could they, why would they, why, I mean, this is just, you know, my answer is, you know, it's probably because it was pretty easy. It, exactly. It wasn't the opposite of that. Why put all of these people together and move this when they need to eat and cook? Well, you know, it probably was pretty easy. It wasn't a exactly. big deal. I read a very interesting article by a, Jesu- a couple of Jesuit priests, and it's ironic that they were destroying so much of the ancient cultures, and yet there's this paradox where they were fascinated by it at the same time, and they actually wrote some of the best eyewitness accounts that still survive today. And uh, one of the ones that fascinated me was the story of two Jesuit priests that were on the Inca Trail going from uh, one mission to another. 
And uh, en route, they came across an, uh, an actual, uh, what they call an Incan grave. Uh, and um, whether it was or not, we don't know, um, because the Inca are very, very recent people. Uh, there were um, uh, people who did far more interesting things way before them, like the uh, Aymara or the Pukina, right. which no one ever talks about. And uh, they said that, uh, you know, we decided to sort of, you know, since the grave was already half open, we decided to help ourselves to some gifts that we could, you know, sell for charity. It's like, yeah, right story. Hmm. And then they said that we were, uh, you know, uh, one of the priests accidentally dropped one of the um, these beautiful uh, pottery, pieces of pottery, and out came this rancid green liquid and uh, with a terrible smell. And uh, they were kind of upset that they broke the pot. And I thought, that's an interesting story because when they came back the following day, they made the most wonderful res- um, uh, remark, the most wonderful observation. And they said, they noted that where the liquid, the pungent liquid had fallen, the rock had actually molten, been made molten. And I'm suddenly going, wait a minute, I, I read a Russian report somewhere that the stones of Saksai Waman were apparently poured into place because when they were quarried 20 miles away on the other side of the valley, they contained fossils. But when they ended up at the um, at Saksai Waman itself, the fossils were gone. And they were saying, there's only one way you can remove those fossils from limestone, and that is the application of super amounts of heat at 1,500 degrees Celsius. Um, ironically, the same temperature that makes crop circles in a fraction of a second. Uh, I find the parallel rather interesting. But um, the fact is that the stones were reconstituted. And I'm thinking, we're so close to the Amazon and all of its riches of plants that uh, you know we obviously are killing quicker than we can find. What if that uh, the ancients had found some molecular acid in some plant that is actually capable of making rock, you know, behave like those beautiful jigsaw puzzle pieces that we see at uh, all over uh, Peru? It just might be that uh, the Jesuits actually found the secrets of all of this. It, it has to be soft, right? That, exactly. that, that it, it, you look at that. There's no way they were cutting this and then replacing it to see if it fits, pulling down a 100-ton rock and and shaping it some more, lifting it up and putting it into place to make it fit into this intricate, uh, you know, wall. Uh, the only, and it's completely asymmetrical from start to finish, right? Well, oh, it's like a very early version of Lego. It really is. Right. And of course, it's earthquake-proof, so they obviously were aware that the region was highly seismic. And here's the best part. There was an astrophysicist who was down there recently, and uh, I wish I'd been there sort of with him because whenever I look at the stones of uh, Saksai Wamana nearby, I'm thinking these are not just uh, geniuses and stonemasons. They're artists because, you know, having gone to art school myself, I can appreciate the aesthetic with which they're all put together. There's not one stone that doesn't belong where it should be. So the eye is very highly trained. And, you know, he looked at the same thing and he started to look at the actual uh, angles and the, uh, the gaps between the angles. And, he, and out of curiosity, he began to measure them. And he's, uh, he's written a paper, which is about to go to peer review as we speak. And he said, you know, it's interesting that all the gaps between the angles and the angles themselves are all numerically significant. They all uh, talk about the numbers relating to the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the earth. They actually mean something. So you're actually looking at a library in stone when you're looking at Saksai Waman. That is genius as far as I'm concerned. I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm just going to keep you for uh, about 10 more minutes, and I know that you're recovering from the flu and, and just got back from out of town. So You love me, Bear. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, is <laughs> is the, uh, and I will, I'll, I'll hook you up in three weeks, okay? That's that's my promise. Is, oh, absolutely. Is uh, uh, the Emerald Tablets of, of Thoth, um, have, you, uh, have you studied those? Uh, here and there, whenever I, I need to sort of uh, reference something in relation to my work, but not fully. It's not something you can take in in one go, uh, and nor should you, uh, because there's quite a, a depth of learning there. Uh, it's, it's actually one of my little pipe dreams that one day I'm going to inherit so much money that I'm going down to Egypt uh, loaded, and I'm going to help dig out the temple of uh, uh, of Toph, as the, as the Greeks call them. Uh, they used to call them Jehuti in his real name. And uh, the temple's still there, and the original tablets apparently are still covered in about 15 feet of Nile mud. The temple is perfectly preserved. You just need someone to dig it up. Uh, it's one of my dreams that I'll, I'll be able to achieve that one day because I, I love the way that guy looks, you know, with his little ibis head uh-huh. and uh, the little pencil and the notebook. And I figured, you know, 
it's like I, I, I idolize this uh, this image because it uh, represents so much of my own journey in a way. So it's, it's kind of personal, but it's just a fact that uh, the tablets are a wealth of wisdom if you care to read them slowly, and also a lot of, a lot of it re- reading between the lines, reading the metaphors for what they are, because that's also where we get a lot of the uh, problems in in translation. We tend to take things too literally, like the uh, the Book of the Dead. Uh, actually, that's not how it was uh, supposed to be translated. The actual translation is the Book of Coming Forth by Light. So in other words, it's a book that actually describes the resurrection of the soul. But as, as it's clearly written out in the Pyramid of Unas, uh, which has been translated recently, um, they're saying the information is, yeah, it's, it's, it's useful for, for, for the dead, that's fine. But it's even more useful for people who are alive. Anyone who understands these images and these words is a very well cared for soul. And this person can enter and leave the other world at will. And it's proven to be true a million times times. That was written on the temple of um, Unas in 2700 BC. If that is proven to be true a million times, that this information allows you to go in between worlds Mm -hmm. while you're alive on Earth, how long have they been doing this? That's the big question. Well, and because the other fascinating thing for me when it comes to Thoth and others, I'm not the only one, uh, when we start to back up throughout history, there is the connection uh, to Atlantis and possibly even going back to Mu and Lumeria. Uh, could could Thoth be that connection uh, throughout time? Uh, it, it seems, you know, the simplest answer is usually the correct one, right? And, <laughs> and I look at Thoth and I start to think that uh, there's there's too much to the story that makes a lot of sense, and it has been repeated over time. Uh, what do you think about that kind of consideration? Oh, I totally agree. In fact, it gets even more interesting when you uh, talk to this uh, story in Yucatan or in Peru to people who really understand the uh, myths and traditions of the uh, the native cultures, of which we know virtually nothing about, because first of all, it's oral, and two, it's never been translated into English, uh, and rightly so, after what the uh, what they endured at the hands of the Spanish. So when you talk about these things, they say, well, one of the biggest hurdles to understanding this information is that, first of all, this comes from um, places that no longer exist. They're now under the ocean. Uh, we call them Mu, or Atl, or Atitlan, um, which you know very well, uh, but also um, they also are written by people uh, uh, who have the same name over different periods of time. So there are many Osirises, there are many uh, Jehutis, there are many Tovs, there are many Virakoshas, and that's where the problems uh, in uh, understanding this come from. Because, you know, historians will say, well, Virakosha, if he was real, would have been about, you know, 2,000 years old, you know, because he borrowed the story from Jesus. Well, the story of Jesus didn't really get there for another 500 years, so how would they ever figure that out? And they were saying quite rightly that, no, many people, many teachers are born over very long periods of time who take on the attributes of a Virakosha or an Osiris or a Tov, and then they pick up the story and they keep adding to the book. And that made so much sense to me because suddenly you realize that well, what we're doing is writing down a very long um, a passage of wisdom that's been handed back to us for 10, 20, 30, 40,000 years, which, of course, is in complete agreement with the king lists of Egypt, of Sumeria, and, of course, in India as well, where they talk about the academies of the gods uh, going back at least 21,000 years, which are now, of course, under the ocean. Right, and and so... When we have the technology today, which is exactly the point that you're bringing up here when we're talking about all of this being discoverable, you know, it's under the ocean now, but now we have satellites, we have Google Earth, uh, we have the ability to go and globally map um, all of this, and we're starting to see things, but is it going to reveal what they don't want us to see. And I'm talking about academia or the new world order, whoever you want to, <laughs> you know, but, but certainly uh, they want to withhold this information from us. They don't, they've always been in control. They're not in control oh, anymore. I, have they? <laughs> I don't know. I would disagree with that. I think they've always been lagging a few steps behind us. Um, ah. I'll give you a case in point, in okay. a, a modern example. Uh, back in the day when I was researching the crop circles, um, my phone used to be bugged all the time. And you could tell because you had a little click on it. Right. But the way I tried it out was that um, I, uh, you know, we used to communicate all kinds of information over the phone. Meanwhile, the really meaty stuff used to come in snail mail. 
And again, anyone that's under 30 will have to Google snail mail. Um, <laughs> I know not what and, uh, you speak. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, there's one famous case where um, I spoke to a friend of mine. And I said, I have it on good authority that um, there's going to be a manifestation at um, get your pencil out, write, write these grid coordinates. And uh, we had these wonderful maps in Britain called the Ordnance Survey Maps, which is deliciously accurate and beautiful. And, uh, you know, you can read them just like you'd uh, read a, you know, a shopping list. And you can give anyone over a phone uh, a six-figure grid coordinate, and you know where you're going to be, uh, mm -hmm. down to about 10 feet. So um, we figured, okay. Meanwhile, we'd send each other the snail mail information saying, well, I think it's actually going to be about six fields away on the other side of the hill. But uh, let's go and find out what happens. And would you believe that, uh, and if this person was alive, he would um, validate the story because it sounds so ridiculous and yet so true. Uh, we're on the side of a hill in England having a nice sandwich and a li nice little cognac because it gets quite cold there in the afternoons, um, watching a whole bunch of men dressed in camouflage circling the entire field waiting for a crop circle to manifest and we're shouting at them you've got the wrong field <laughs> and sure enough the crop circle appeared a day later you know two fields behind where we were sitting and not in the place where we told them uh, so no i think that they're always going to be several steps behind because they're working with the wrong energy um, anything that works for right action and for the betterment of humanity in general uh, has a certain ring to it there's a certain frequency about it and if you ally yourself with that um, as most researchers do you'll find that the doors start opening I and mean, that's been true in my life where you know I've asked the right questions got out of my own way and I am astonished by how easily the information comes to me and you could you double check it and it's there um, the people who are doing this for nefarious reasons, they might have a little bit of luck, but they're probably tapping into the wrong energy, and they're probably getting into the, all the abduction scenarios and all the negative stuff, which happens, and it's all part and parcel of the big picture called the, uh, the universe, um, but they're never really going to get to the real mystery of things. They will never really hide things, because I think people like us are much closer to the truth and want to know the truth, and you want to apply it for good things, and to the, again, to the betterment of society, and I think we'll all always be one step ahead, even though it may not seem like it in the media. So I think the trick is just not to sort of buy into the fear and all of that. You know, and by, by, by all means, you know, keep track of what the snakes are up to because you've got to know what they're doing. Uh, otherwise, you know, you won't know the big picture, but don't buy into the, the whole fear stuff. And I think we'll be fine. I mean, it sounds very romantic, but well, but that's who I am, though. I'm a bit of a romantic in that way, and I think we'll win in the end. How close have you been uh, to witnessing uh, the actual formation of a crop circle? Oh, that's a, that's a, it's a sad and frustrating story and yet humorous. Um, we uh, got very, very, very close. Um, and having said that, there's, there's 60 uh, known eyewitnesses around the world who've actually seen him happening, and they all say the same thing, uh, 15 seconds or less, usually preceded by a tube of light that rotates the crop, goes back up, and the crop circle appears instantaneously. Um, and I thought, it's got to be one of us at one point. We've, been, you know, we've, we've all sacrificed our houses, our bank accounts, our marriages, mm -hmm. uh, and our hair and our guitar playing to do this. Surely we should should be able to see it. So in 1999, I decided to actually undertake an experiment, a closed experiment where the people who were involved had no idea that I was doing this. Otherwise, it would invalidate the whole thing. And I said, uh, okay, the whole point is to try and see if we can figure out we're going to catch them at it in some way. I had people using psychic ability. Uh, I was, some people were doing mathematics and geometry. Uh, I was doing dowsing uh, just to sort of fine tune my uh, intuitive skills. And after about a month, we were getting pretty good at it, actually. The timing was always off because their timing and ours never coincide. I mean, we work on a 24-hour uh, solar cycle here, but you know, everybody else is working on a very different time scale altogether. Right. So timing is always a bit problematic, and that's uh, acceptable. But location, we were getting it down to within two fields, uh, timing usually within about two days, and we're getting pretty good at it. And I, I felt confident enough to approach six people on both sides of the Atlantic, um, computer experts, psychics, mathematicians, musicians, uh, lay people, and I just asked them three questions. One, where do you think the big one is going to be this year? Two, what uh, time frame would you uh, feel that it would be appearing in? And three, if you can, the geometry or the shape. And uh, 
I didn't share any of this with any of them, and they were all pretty much in the same ballpark. It was going to be around this town called Devizes in England. Uh, it would have a certain nine-pointed geometry about it, but there was something else in it as well. And no one could really quite figure it out. Uh, and there was a sort of a seven number in there as well. And uh, the time frame came within sort of 48 hours of, uh, I think it was like the end of July or the beginning of August in 1999. So I thought, okay, now we have an idea. So I kept this from everybody, and I confided it only two people. And I said, right, let's go over there uh, today, and because um, it's on a hill, we can actually see into the field in question and see what's happening. Right. So we went there in one bright afternoon, and you could see this uh, sort of swirling mass of air, like something's building in there. Um, and I'm thinking, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. But, you know, it's not in the field where we said it was. It's in the field next door, which is about a half a mile away. But that's still pretty good, given the size of the country sure, sure. and there's thousands of fields. So we began to do a bit of just quiet meditation. We thought, I think it's going to happen on the morning, this particular morning, on the Friday. Okay, perfect. We're going to write that down, keep it between us. That's it. I called up my, my pilot on Wednesday, and I said, Graham, I want to book the first uh, flight uh, in the morning, uh, 8 in the morning, regardless of weather, and I'm not going to tell you where we're going. Okay. So we had that set up. And so the night before, the Thursday night, we're all set, we're already in my little living room. We've got flasks of brandy. We have fleece blankets. Uh, I mean, it gets really, really damp in England in the evening, believe me, right. uh, even in the summer. And, um, you know, we had night vision equipment, cameras, tripods. We were really going to catch them at it this time. Anyway, 10.30, all I remember is someone trying to pull me off the sofa going, don't, you can't fall asleep now because we're going to miss it. I said, I, I can't even get my head uh, up off the floor. I mean, I feel like an elephant's on top of my chest. Right. And I just blacked out. I mean, next thing I remember, it was like 7 in the morning. Everybody's completely collapsed on my living room floor, far to sleep. And I went, oh, God, we've missed this. What the hell's happened? It's like someone threw in a pellet of sleeping gas into the room. And um, I didn't wake anybody up. I boyishly got into my uh, GTI, drove like a maniac, uh, which is pretty much accounts for anybody in Britain, and um, made it to this little airfield completely covered with fog, and my pilot's there. And uh, I said, right, here are the coordinates. We're going to go to this field at Roundway. And he puts down his helmet and says, look, if you think there's going to be a crop circle there this morning, uh, forget it. I flew over that field last night at 9 o'clock at night because um, it's still bright there at the time of the year. And there was nothing there. There's no way anybody's going to make a crop circle in that short space of time. And I thought, just humor me. I said, but it's foggy. It's really hard to fly in this, and you're going to, it's going to cost you a fortune. I said, just humor me. Okay. So we flew around. We went to Roundway, and the fog was just not going anywhere. We circled around once, twice, three times. And then suddenly, it just parted. And right underneath us, exactly where six people said it would be, in the shape that they said it would be, there it was, this monstrous thing, huge thing, beautiful. And all I could hear in my headphones was an expletive from my pilot, which I would not repeat on the air. And it was classic. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that uh, the reason, and when I got back into the car and uh, went to see uh, the people that are now uh, getting up off my living room floor, uh, one of them was a, a trance uh, medium, and she was saying, and I hadn't given her any information. And she was saying, well, uh, I've been told that the reason why uh, we, were, we were not allowed to see is because they wanted to prove to us that, yes, we can communicate with this consciousness. But had we been anywhere near that crop circle, the frequency is so off the charts that it would fry the, uh, the circuit boards in our body because we are, we are electrical beings after all. Sure. It would have and done all the work that we've been doing on you for years, which sounds a little bit weird. And um, the phone suddenly um, uh, comes on, and my friend who was doing some work with electronic systems and measuring energy with his little gizmos, he calls and says, you, uh, I don't know if you've been here, but uh, I'm, I'm here right now, and do not go anywhere near this crop circle. I said, why? He said, because I've, I'm a quarter of a mile away. I have 16 packs of batteries that have all gone dead. All the equipment that has LCD displays has gone black. Anything electrical is short-circuiting. Uh, I mean, the, it, this, the readings went off the chart, and the equipment is broken. And my channel of friend was right, raising a high five, saying, told you. <laughs> now, what would have happened to the plane if you had flown over? 
It uh, began to register a very alarming array of red warning lights. Uh, the gyroscope started doing some very strange things, and the compasses were pointing south instead of north. Right. And uh, Graham knows, uh, has had, he's had his enough share of experiences to know that perhaps we shouldn't fly directly over and stay around the periphery. And I agreed with that, uh, because even when I sort of uh, went down there, because I mean, I had to do it because I had to uh, document what was there. Um, I, all the cameras that I took uh, within the crop circle, they all fried. And uh, even I fried for 48 hours. Uh, I was really, really ill. And they were saying, uh, the watchers were saying, you know, this crop circle was not meant for you. It was meant for the earth. It was meant to help stabilize the earth, to buy you enough time to realize that changes are upon you and you have to act accordingly. So there's a bit of a warning here. Uh, not to put it in a negative way, but just saying, you know, it's the earth has to shift and you have to be aware of the changes and prepare accordingly, obviously. Um, so it was not really meant for you. And this is when we do this deliberately. Uh, some circles are designed for people, some are designed for healing and some are designed for the earth. And your gut feeling knows the difference between one and the other. If you don't feel well going near it, that's our way of telling you, don't go in. Just go and you know, wait for another one to come along. And when you feel good about that, then go into that one. So it's a wonderful moment of communication just to prove that we can communicate uh, with other levels of uh, reality and uh, they can communicate back. But do they completely reveal their, uh, their underwear? Absolutely not. We have to figure out the, uh, all, the, all the pieces and that's how they've always said it's been done. How much, how much did you miss it by? Um, well, we uh, we just basically slept right through it uh, because the um, the um, eyewitnesses always claim that they happened between two and three in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, and except for two cases which have been seen during actually three cases uh, which are seen in bright daylight, one which actually appeared beside Stonehenge in that, 1997. I was, was going to ask you a, about that. Yeah, and that. So the tour bus, uh, I'll let you tell the story, but the tour bus dropped off, picked up people, split, no crop circle. They came back, what, 45 minutes later, I think? Is that oh, right? it's better. Um, there was a pilot that was flying uh, not far uh, off from the um, alignment of Stonehenge to uh, the nearby uh, base, uh, Fruxton. Uh, sorry, not Fruxton. Uh, I'm getting two things confused here. I can't remember the name of the airfield, but it's a, it's a military airfield not far from there. And uh, they uh, asked permission to land a small Cessna and didn't really report anything out of the ordinary. Fifteen minutes later, uh, another Cessna with a doctor on board reported uh, permission to land and went, wait a minute, what the hell is that? <laughs> so we have a 15-minute window. On the ground, the guards usually go around every 15 minutes to find out if anybody's jumped the fence and not paid the queen her usual 15 pounds to get into Stonehenge, which, by the way, is completely illegal. They're not supposed to be charging admission to Stonehenge. Stonehenge, um, they basically reported nothing untoward in their first round. And they're on high ground, by the way, compared to the field in where the crop circle appeared. And 15 minutes later, they said, what the hell is that? And it gets better because there was one a, a car, a cab driver going along the road between the two fields uh, that separate Stonehenge from the crop circle field. And uh, it's a major thoroughfare that connects uh, the center of England to the southwest. And um, he said, it was bright daylight, uh, middle of the afternoon, uh, I think it was 4.15 in the afternoon. And he said, well, suddenly there's like this beam came down in the middle of the field. There's this fog that swirled around for 15 seconds. And it's always 15 seconds. And then it lifted, and uh, I, you know, I, I put my brakes on, and uh, jumped on top of the uh, the hood of my car, and there's this massive crop circle. And we know he's telling the truth because he started the five mile tailback. Um, so he actually saw the whole thing happening in 15 seconds. Amazing stuff. But they usually appear between two and three in the morning, uh, the majority of them. And I wanted to figure out why. Uh, I was having dinner one evening with a, uh, a doctor from the London College of Medicine, and he, was, he took an interest in this. He said, and that's quite interesting that, that the crop circles appear between those times because 95% of reported hospital deaths also occur between two and four in the morning. And we began to throw ideas around the table and we suddenly realized, well, you do realize that at that time in the morning, that's the face of the Earth that's furthest from the sun and its gravitational pull, which means the Earth's gravitational field is a little bit weaker and it allows the soul to leave if you're dying, but it also allows information to enter the Earth as well where you are. 
And that made so much sense because when you talk to this to Persians or the Hopi uh, or any indigenous culture, they'll say, yes, that's called the reed of heaven. And those reeds are all connected to the half of the sacred sites. Uh, and that's what allows information to flow from uh, one space to the next. And uh, NASA, uh, incredibly, in 2008, they released a, pr a press release where they uh, said, uh, we have discovered that every eight minutes, the Earth connects to the sun f with magnetic portals, and they open and close every eight minutes. And those are the reeds of heaven that the ancestors were talking about that link their sacred sites to the stars, and it also allows crop circle information to appear. So all of these things suddenly are beginning to come together in a beautiful connection. Well, you know, when somebody says to me, um, hey, you know, Jimmy, uh, where's the uh, definitive UFO video? Where's the definitive <laughs> photograph? I come back with, where's the video of somebody hoaxing a, fro uh, a crop circle? Somebody said, you know, I, 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 nobody's been busted. You know, the hoaxes, the hoaxes, you know, could be a couple of old guys in the middle of a field with a board and a rope. Okay, that's, you know, okay, I get that. But the good stuff, the real ones, of which there are hundreds of, nobody's ever been busted. And I find that fascinating. Oh, they have been busted, but it's just that the uh, when you actually compare what the uh, that's what, what I mean. made compared to the real thing, <laughs> right? They basically it's like um, you know uh, this is a this is a beautiful flower pressed in the museum case, and this is a chance encounter between mating elephants. The right, two just don't connect. <laughs> uh, they have gotten better. I have to admit. I mean, the hoaxing has gotten a lot better. And the, a friend of mine once said, you know, once your book gets published, um, the hoaxing is going to improve because you're going to tell them how harmonics work and actually the designs have gotten visually a lot better but only from the air i mean once you actually look close up the trained eye knows the difference immediately you know the first thing you look for is the fact that you can't bend the stalks without breaking them if you're if you're going to make them uh, i've watched people making crop circles even when they're so careful uh, they still manage to crease all the plants and in the real ones they just bend and in fact the plants are hovering above the soil uh, i've been to uh, real circles uh, first thing in the morning uh, the only person I have to take off my boots uh, and try to not to, to break things. And the moment I touch them, you can hear this crunching sound and you feel terrible because it looks like a work of art. Mm -hmm. And it is. And there's no damage whatsoever. And you can hear a ringing in your ears because there's an energy field there that's measurable for up to five years later. Um, there was one uh, case where I actually went out with a pair of bent coat hangers in the middle of a field that was fallow. Um, and you know, so you couldn't see anything except for dirt. And I was actually able to not only to figure out where the original crop circle was from three years earlier, I could actually stake out the exact design, uh, which takes a lot of effort, by the way, mental preparation. But still, the energy is what's important. The pattern is the create is created by the energy that underlies it, and you can't fake that. Um, I've seen cases where the uh, their satellites, and I think it was the uh, editor of Nexus who actually pointed me onto this. Um, he said, you know, it's interesting that some of the observations that you've made this year about fleeting energy and crop circles, if you go back and measure it, I bet there won't be any, anything there. So I went back, and sure enough, there was no energy at these crop circles. And I thought, well, that's weird. That's not supposed to happen. And he said, you know, if the, if the design had been man-made and it had been flooded with microwave energy from a satellite, which, of course, we have that technology, mm -hmm. that would actually answer your question. And it did, because I was looking at these designs, which are pretty good, but not good enough to be the real thing. And the, the plants... Um, when the, they began to regrow the following season, everything was stunted in there like it had been microwaved. And, of course, microwave, when you um, throw, throw it at any object, it will be there for an hour and then it dissipates. Right. But the crop circle energy stays there for years and you can actually measure it years later. So, again, all of these things, and including the, the change to the plant's um, uh, biology, the, the soil also has its uh, mineral content altered. These things cannot be done by people. So that's the litmus test for any real crop circle. But there is plenty of hoaxing going on, believe me. And uh, it's annoying because it's, uh, it's done to distract you and get to chase your own tail. So the, the trick is, if you really want to get into the heart of the phenomenon, stick with the early stuff, like from the 70s right down to about 1999, 2002, 
after that, you're in very dodgy territory, believe me. So, um, but it's always been a conversation. I mean, and like any conversation, it has a beginning and an end. Um, the thing that people find frustrating about me is that uh, I never talk about crop circles so much anymore. I said, well, there's not really anything new to talk about because the, the conversation has really been given to us. We have the information. We have to apply it now. Uh, and the thing is, there's so much uh, information that's available. For example, there's people in Australia, in America, and in England who have actually built a scale model of the picture on the front cover of my book. And I put that picture on the cover of my book for a very good reason, because I know what it does. It's an anti-gravity device. And these three people, without me mentioning this uh, in the book, they actually went ahead and built it as an anti-gravity device. And they've succeeded in, uh, in building it. And they're keeping it pretty quiet. They, you won't know who they are uh, until the right political moment appears on the horizon for them to reveal the information. So this is what I mean about this being a very important phenomenon in our time. It's giving us new technology as well and information which can be applied you know, once the right moment appears. I want to thank you right now. I've got one minute left uh, before we have to sign off. I want to thank you for the conversation first, but you're going to be you're going to be at contact in the desert in three weeks. Uh, Quickly, uh, what are you going to be talking about this year? Well, I'm going to be talking about some of the hidden knowledge in crop circles, um, and then I'm going to be talking about a parallel um, stuff that I do now, which is really uh, uh, an offshoot of my research with crop circles, which is to do with the origin of megalithic sites and uh, why they're built the way they're built and what they do to you and what they do for you. And it's all to do with this out-of-body experience called the living resurrection where you access the other world. So I'm literally talking about uh, the same story, except that one of them is built uh, using flattened plants and the other one's built with very large rocks. Same technology and the same process, which is the expansion of um, human awareness. Absolutely extraordinary conversation. Are all of your books available at InvisibleTemple.com? They are indeed, and all my DVDs and lots of free articles, and you'll be there for a month. Uh, But that doesn't mean that it gives anybody an excuse not to listen to your show, Jimmy. (laughs) Thank you so much. Freddie, stay right there. I'm going to sign off, and then I'll say uh, goodnight after uh, we run credits. Stay right there for me. You can say okay, Freddie. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Our guest tonight, <laughs> Freddie Silva, and he will be joining us uh, in three weeks out there in, in Palm Springs at Contact in the Desert. Really quick, Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitola, Mark D. Kovar, Webmaster, Drew the Geek. Music, just for Freddie, is Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm yours, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Tomorrow night... Right here, Nick Pope. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.